Go. Good evening and welcome to another exciting edition of the Isleworth and Brentford Area Forum. My name is Councillor Salman Shaheen and I will be your host tonight. It's now 5.31pm and I would like to welcome you all to this virtual meeting of the Area Forum. I would like to welcome members who are sitting this evening as well as council officers who will be assisting members throughout the evening. And in addition, I would like to welcome members of the public who are watching this meeting at home. And I know many of you out there have written to me in, over these past long months of lockdown saying, when are the area forums going to come back? When are they going to come back? We, 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 we love the area forums so much. And I love the area forums too. I, 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 I hear every single word you're saying and we are back. I'm very glad to say we're back. As you may all know, until relatively recently, of course, virtual meetings for council business were not legal. Um, so, uh, so, so it's it, 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 it's it's very much the case now that, as required by government, the law the law has been changed to let authorities meet in a virtual way. So this meeting is absolutely taking place using those new government regulations. Now, the way this meeting will work is that, as chair, I'll be running the meeting and inviting members to speak. And I, but I would ask members to switch off their cameras and mute their microphones when they're not addressing the meeting. This means that only one person will be speaking at a time and there should be no background noise, making it easier for everyone to follow the meeting, including those of you watching at home. Now, when members wish to alert me to the fact they want to speak, they should switch on their cameras. The exception to this arrangement will be Councillor Collins, who is joining this meeting by telephone, and Councillor Smart, whose camera doesn't seem to be working currently. Uh, and and please, members, do bear in mind that I'm juggling windows uh, at the moment. So if I don't immediately see your uh, your your camera come on um, in front of me, then please do bear with me. I will come to everyone who has their camera on and does wish to speak in due course. I will aim to make sure that members have ample opportunity to ask questions and make comments on the items submitted for discussion this evening. Council officers supporting the meeting may turn on their microphone to alert me of any procedural or constitutional issue that needs addressing, although I expect this to be a rare occurrence in case I completely mess this up, which is always possible. We also have producers for the meeting from our ICT department who may wish to contact me if necessary. But again, I really hope this goes well and that that will be unlikely. As there may, may be others who, like Councillor Collins, will be listening to the proceedings, I would also ask members to always say who they are when they make a contribution and to speak slowly and clearly for the same reason. Now, this is our first meeting since February. There may be some people who watching at home who have never seen the glory that is the Isleworth and Brentford area forum before, and they may not know who we are. So I'm going to eat, ask every member of the, the, the Isleworth and Brentford area forum here tonight to introduce themselves one by one. I'm going to start. My name's Councillor Salman Shaheen, as I mentioned. I'm the chair of the area forum, and I'm also one of the ward councillors for Isleworth. Now I'll take the remaining councillors and uh, introductions in alphabetical order. Do we have Mel Collins yet? I know he was running late. Do we have Mel Collins? No, that's fine. I'll come back to Mel. Um, Unsa Chowdhury. Hello, I'm Councillor Unsa Chowdhury, the, one of the councillors for Austin Spring Grove Ward. Steve Curran. Hello, I'm Councillor Steve Curran. Uh, I'm the Councillor for Zion Ward and Leader of the Council. Theo Dennison. No, Theo. OK, Catherine Dunn. Hi, I'm Councillor Catherine Dunn. I'm um, Councillor for Scion Ward and Cabinet Member for Communities and the Climate Emergency. Richard Eason. I believe Richard Eason said he was restarting his computer actually, so but he is he is intending to be at this meeting and indeed was here a second ago, so he should hopefully be joining us in a moment. Guy Lambert, do we have Guy Lambert yet? Again, I know Guy was just leaving one meeting and coming to another one, so it's possible he's not here yet. Not to worry, I am assured Guy will be here shortly. Tony Lukey. Tony Lukey, 
uh, Councillor for Ossel in Spring Grove Ward, uh, speaking to you from the Mayor's Parlour at Hounslow House, because I'm the Mayor. I'll be leaving to uh, join another meeting um, about seven-ish um, mayoral duties, but uh, good to be back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Darnish Said. Hello, I'm Darnish Said, Councillor for Isleworth. Sue Sampson. Okay, we don't uh, seem to have Sue here. And Corinna Smart. Oh, good evening, Councillor Corinna Smart, Brentford Ward. Thank you very much, Councillors. I'm also going to introduce the officers who are going to be speaking tonight on the various different discussion items. We have on discussion item number one, Ben Knowles. Good evening, Chair. Uh, ben, if you could introduce yourself and your role. So I am Ben Knowles. I am the Assistant Director of Communications, Engagement and Public Affairs. Thank you very much, Ben. And we'll come back to your presentation in a moment when we've uh, concluded this uh, this first round of introductions. Uh, next to introduce is Paul Trainer, who will be introducing discussion item number two. Good evening, Chair. Uh, I'm Paul Trainer. I'm the Interim Head of Traffic and Transport. I've just received a note from Guy Lambert that he is now indeed in the room. Um, Guy, would you like to briefly introduce yourself as we, we missed you in the introduction stage? Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Guy Lambert, uh, ward member for Brentford and lead member for, well, I, I like to say lead member for Mess and trading companies, so that's Bins and, uh, and Hounslow Highways. Thank you, Guy. We also have um, with us um, three very important officers without whom we would just not be able to, to, to run this evening today. So the first up is Mark Frost. Thank you, Chair. Um, as Mark Frost, I'm Assistant Director for Transport, Parking and Environmental Strategy. Uh, but for purposes of this meeting, I am the Area uh, Participation Officer. Thank you, Mark. We also have it's, Kay Duffy. It, sorry. Oh. Yes, Grinna. Sorry, it's Mel. I've just had Mel on the phone. He needs the code because he can't get in. Okay, I'll would someone to be able to thank, thank, thank you, you very much. much. I'll let it. Oh, how do you send it? Oh, oh, sorry, Kay, can you just make sure you send it to him on um, text, please? Will do. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. Fantastic. And um, you just heard the voice there of, of Kay Duffy, who can now introduce herself. Good evening, members. Um, I'm Kay Duffy. I'm from Democratic Services and I'm your clerk this evening. And last but very much not least, Jyoti Patel. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jyoti Patel, also from Democratic Services, uh, supporting uh, Clark this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jyoti. So we also have officers acting in a producing role for the technical side of the meeting, but as they're not expected to be involved in the discussion of, of the meeting, unless something goes disastrously wrong, I will thank them for all their tremendous help, but not ask them to introduce themselves at this stage. Chair, can I interrupt just for a moment? Yeah. I don't think you introduced Mr. Trainer. I did indeed introduce Mr. Trainer, um, but then Guy Lambert immediately came in and uh, and alerted me to the fact uh, he was he was in there. So it was a slightly rushed introduction to Paul Trainer, um, but I will be coming back to him very shortly. Apologies, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, okay, so members of the public are reminded that the agenda and all items being discussed by the Area Forum tonight can be found on the Council website under the Isleworth and Brentford Area Forum meetings page. So if you want to see them, that's where to look. I also want to make sure that all members have seen the agenda. Please speak now or forever hold your peace. Thank you very much. If you should find you're having any technical problems and need to log out of the meeting and come back in again, members, please do let me know immediately, ideally beforehand, but if not afterwards, by turning on your camera and microphone, this would be a permitted interruption. We can then decide how far we need to recap if that's necessary. Finally, I would say to any member of the public listening or watching, thank you for joining us this evening. We hope the meeting will go well, but any virtual meetings may suffer from unexpected technical hitches, so please bear with us. I should also clarify that this meeting is being recorded and it will be made available on the Council's YouTube channel in the next few days. 
Contributors to the meeting are asked to remember that they will therefore be included in the recording of this public meeting. And I'm sure we have the fantastic John Dale from Brentford Today and TV watching as well. A quick note about submitting questions for this evening's meeting. Members of the public are asked to submit questions for the area forum ahead of the meeting where possible, as they were not able to speak to members directly um, as they would in a conventional meeting. <laughs> However, for residents watching this meeting, it is possible to submit questions via the Q&A function on Microsoft Teams during the meeting itself. Select Q&A on the right side of the screen and type in your question in the compose box and then select send. If you would prefer to ask your question anonymously, select ask anonymously and members will then try to answer as many questions as they can on the night with the APO Mark Frost facilitating the asking and answering of the questions as he does so very well during the physical meetings we've had. But thank you. We will now move on to the first item on our agenda. And the first item is apologies for absence. I know there's a couple of councillors not, not currently here, but uh, have we had any apologies for absence? OK, may I take declarations of interest and communications from members? <laughs> OK, it sounds like we don't have any. Um, Corinna, do you know if Mel's on now on the phone? Uh, he hasn't rung me back, but okay. we probably will do. If he doesn't get in, he'll ring me again. Um, so I'll let you know then, Chair. He customarily gives his vice chair's update at this point, and I wanted to leave uh, a couple of minutes for him. But let's take the minutes first and I'll, I'll come back to Mel afterwards. Are there any matters arising from the minutes and can we confirm its accuracy? Let's take matters arising. Have we got Councillor Eason on? Because I know he had matters arising. Yeah, I think I'm here. Yeah, you're here. Right, um, and I submitted some uh, matters arising by email, which um, I believe that Mark has and has some answers too. OK, Mark, do you want to address the Councillor Easton's matters arising? Uh, yes, I can do. OK, so you had the um, following matters arising. If I can get my windows in the right place. Um, so you first of all asked for what the design, uh, what the status was for the design and implementation of the cycleway on South Street, which I think was approved at the area forum back in, in February. Seems a very long time ago of this year. Um, I can confirm that's currently in detailed design. Uh, we're working through the various um, uh, detailed design issues necessary to build that to construction uh, with a view to building it in the first half of, of next year. Uh, we're looking to see if we can get on site this financial year, but we've yet to confirm that yet. You then asked a question about um, details for uh, enforcement, uh, whether there any fixed penalty notice or prosecutions for fly posting had been issued. Um, I've uh, conferred with LBH enforcement, also Hounslow Highways, and whilst I've got an update here, which I'll provide via email about various activity that have gone uh, that has happened uh, since the meeting, uh, no no actual uh, FPNs or prosecutions have been issued, and they're, they're happy to discuss that further with you. Um, you had a request for an update on the availability and allocation of Section 106 and SIL funding, um, and you particularly asked for an update on the 50% local neighbourhood SIL. Um, I have uh, provided that information over to planning and they're going to get back in contact with you uh, directly, um, Councillor Eason, and we can also provide a note on the minutes when we have that information as well. Uh, you asked for um, whether in respect to additional healthcare provision, whether we can get an update from Hounslow CCG on plans for the West Middlesex hub and the Brentford hub, um, with those locations fulfill any proximity standards around the 15 minute neighbourhood as a topical um, subject. Um, and uh, I've absolutely noted that, and I'm sure that we can request that update of the CCG at a future meeting. Uh, you asked for an update on the workplace parking levy proposals, um, which is a proposal for the Great West Corridor. Um, uh, actually, this is covered in a, a, a question that has gone uh, that come to the open forum. Uh, but in short, the business case work has continued over the over the, the last few months, and a consultation is planned uh, for next year. You asked for uh, an update on bus route development, in particular those relating to the E1 H28 and the proposed X91 route. 
Um, that's also in that response to the open forum question from uh, the Austin White Green Residents Association. But, but in short, TfL are not in a position to progress any changes to the bus network at the current time. However, we are in discussion with them on these proposals as part of the workplace parking levy um, uh, proposal and initiative. Uh, and finally, you asked for an update on the community safety strategy and uh, whether that has been completed. And once again, I've, I've requested that information and the team will get back in contact with you directly on that. And we, we can add a note on the minutes to that. Uh, and those were the points that you raised in your email, Richard. Councillor Reeson. Yes. Mark, yeah, you thank you, Mark. That's great. Yeah. OK, great. Are we all happy to confirm the accuracy of the minutes, uh, if anyone can remember quite what happened all that time ago? Uh, Chair, I provided a slight change update uh, to my declaration, which uh, um, the officer has uh, to incorporate in the um, uh, in the minutes. Absolutely. And with that slight change made, can you confirm the accuracy of the amended minutes? Yes, thank Noted. you. Very much. OK, all right, great. OK, um, just checking if we've got Mel yet. Chair, I've opened my camera up. Ah, yes. It's actually quite hard to see. I do apologise. The reason why I couldn't, it's hard to see cameras at the moment because the presentation is on my screen. Um, if we could just, uh, when, um, when, when not presenting, if we can not have presentations on the screen, it would be easier to see, um, see who wants to speak. But yes, Steve. Uh, just an, um, Christine Darwell wrote to me in the week and we agreed an amendment to the February minutes. I just want that to be noted and uh, Kay Duffy's got that information. Noted. Thank you, Councillor. I do. Thank you. And Guy, I see your camera's on. Is that uh, because you wish to speak? No. <clears throat> OK, if you could, uh, if you wouldn't mind turning your camera off unless you wish to speak, that'd be great. OK, thanks. Um, cool. Uh, right. What's next? Uh, yeah, I, I should remind you that normally I'd sign a, a physical copy of the, the minutes, um, but as that's not possible right now, um, the minutes will be formally, formally record that we've agreed the minutes as a record of the last meeting. I'm very happy to do so here. OK, so we now move on to the first item for discussion, community engagement. Hounslow Council is currently in the middle of a wide ranging review of the way we engage with our residents. We want to build stronger relationships with our residents and develop effective partnerships between the council and our citizens. To discuss our plans, I'm very pleased to introduce Councillor Catherine Dunn, Cabinet Member for Communities and Climate Emergencies, to open the item. And this she'll be followed by Ben Knowles, Assistant Director of Communications, Public Affairs and Engagement, who will be presenting this item this evening on behalf of Elliot Brooks, Director of Communities, who together with Mandy Skinner, our Assistant Chief, Chief Executive, is leading on the development of a new way of engaging with our communities. Please send in any questions you may have during their presentation and we will address them tonight. So I'm now going to hand over to Councillor Dunn. Chair, Councillor Collins has now joined the meeting. Ah, Councillor Collins. Um, I will go, uh, we'll get, we're, we're now in discussion item one, uh, Mel, but I'm going to come back to you and your, uh, your vice chair's update after we finished discussion item one. And if I neglect to do that for any reason, uh, you, you, you know how to shout at me, don't you? I do. <laughs> cool. All right. Brilliant. Catherine. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce this item um, to explain. Um, well, Ben will explain in more detail, but um, just to uh, let you know, about the work that we've been doing um, recently um, to develop a new approach to engaging with communities. Uh, this work builds on the ambitions that we set out in our thriving community strategy and in the corporate plan. The coronavirus pandemic, um, when it arrived earlier this year, like everyone else, it took us uh, by surprise and it changed um, a lot of the ways that we were having to work as a council. Um, what we hope that we've, we've been able to do and that, that we can continue to build on is actually using that as an opportunity um, to develop new relationships with, with residents and community groups, as we had to do during that, that first um, lockdown period. 
um, as we we worked with community groups to um, to support the most vulnerable members of our, our community. Um, it was as we moved out of that phase, um, it was clear that um, that we wanted to both prioritise and strengthen some of those relationships that have been built over the course of, of that first wave of the pandemic. And as part of our recovery programme from COVID-19, we established um, a community recovery board that sat alongside other recovery boards um, as part of the, the council's recovery programme. Um, so this board, which I chaired, um, has been leading on improving our knowledge, understanding and representation of our residents. One of the things, um, and I stress it is only one of the things that the, the board did, was to commission the review of community engagement that actually some of you have already been involved in, um, in various uh, guises, whether it's taking part in um, virtual workshops or being interviewed. Um, and we'd like to thank people who have taken part. For those who haven't, see this as, as a first um, part of, of the conversation that we want everyone to be involved in. And um, there will be many more opportunities ahead. Um, it is just the start of a conversation. We will be reaching out further to, to residents, to ward councillors, um, to community groups, uh, to understand how people's experiences of this particular strange phase in our lives can help to to shape our future approach. Um, we were to have uh, Elliot here tonight, um, as, as you'll see on, on your agenda. Um, he's not able to make it, he's got another meeting, um, but he's been working very closely with um, Mandy, our Assistant Chief Executive, and also Ben, who I'm going to hand over to now um, to talk you through uh, what we've been doing and, and how we'd like to to get you involved. Thank you. OK, thank you, Councillor Dunn. So for those who have just joined, my name is Ben Knowles and I'm the Assistant Director of Communications, Public Affairs and Engagement. And so here myself, Mandy Skinner and Elliot Brooks, but also important to mention Laura James, who is our Consultation and Engagement Manager. I've been leading on this piece of work, which we began in the summer, about how we can improve community engagement across the borough. So you see from the slide, one Hounslow, many voices, that speaks to the fact that, of course, we are one borough, we're a council serving one borough, but one of the great strengths of Hounslow, one of the reasons officers and councillors like us are so proud to serve the borough, is its diversity, one of the most diverse boroughs in the country. Uh, I think 188 different languages spoke here, and what we do know is that we don't reach them all equally. Uh, and that's something that we want to change and we're going to change through this piece of work. So I'll just talk to a few slides about this review. As Councillor Dunn said, it's very much in its first stages now. This is the first time we start to speak about it publicly in this round of area forums. Uh, and then I'll talk about the next steps and then take any questions. Great to hear any ideas, any thoughts, anything about that, because that is a key part of this piece of work is hearing what people have got to say. So just a bit of context, which Councillor Dunn touched upon there. So our response to coronavirus, uh, as well as managing the pandemic, and of course we're still in it at the moment, and there's a huge amount of work went into that, we quickly turned to recovery as well. And you know, how are we going to support our communities through the recovery of coronavirus? We're going to be one of the hardest hit boroughs. We've got many tough months ahead of us. And what we knew, of course, before coronavirus struck, that we do some really good engagement as a council. But as I said at the beginning, we also need to reach more communities. That was an aspiration we already had. Lots of things were in train, but what coronavirus really shone a light on is that often some of these communities were some of the hardest hit by coronavirus and we couldn't reach them and we wanted to engage with them and we were struggling and it made us aware that we really needed to redouble our efforts around this. Uh, and so part of the recovery structure, we had four task forces, one about economic recovery, one about health and social care, one about green recovery and then one about community recovery. And that was chaired by Councillor Dunn. And you will see on this slide, on the right hand side, you have the outcomes of what this recovery board was wanting to achieve. 
so that all residents are socially connected and live in pleasant neighbourhoods where they can play a role in their community. All residents and communities are involved in shaping the place they live and the services they receive by having a strong and influential community voice. A thriving and sustainable voluntary and community sector that co-designs and delivers to meet the needs of our residents and residents receive the right help and support in order to lead independent, healthy lives with skills, confidence and resources to support themselves and each other. Now on the left, you've got four cogs and they represent the four areas, the four themes, if you like, which really underpinned our work around community recovery. So understanding our community. So that was all about the data, what information we had to tell us what, what people were going through, what support they needed, what sort of experience they had. Part of that included a survey that we sent out to the whole borough, had over a thousand responses to help inform our support. Uh, then we have the new dialogue with our residents and that's this piece which I'm talking to now, which is about improving engagement. Really closely aligned to that is another big piece of work, which is in, you know, investing to get the best out of our VCSE. So that's a piece of work about, you know, how do we harness the fantastic work that was carried out by voluntary groups, community organisations, mutual aid groups, many of whom we knew, many of whom we weren't aware of, that really came to the fore and epitomised sort of one Hounslow response to coronavirus supporting so many people. We worked closely with a lot of those during the pandemic, established new relations with them. And so how do we build on that? How do we work more strategically with them going forward and really embed a new approach to how we all work together, uh, supporting our diverse communities? And then at the end, you have the whole system community solutions approach to address need. And so that really came out of the community hub, which was set up at the start of the pandemic to support our shielded residents, those identified by the NHS, I think there were about 22,500 initially set up to make sure they got the food that they need, but that quickly developed into uh, other kinds of support, uh, support around social issues, loneliness, mental health, getting uh, shopping, whatever it might be. And through that work, we connected with so many different individuals, so many different organisations, 400 plus volunteers, that we realised, well, this is a great way of doing things, a great way of reaching people at their point of need, but also then connecting them to all sorts of other things which they will find useful and that they need and they need help with. And so that is a piece of work. Well, how do we sort of transfer that community hub from Brentford Village Centre into something much more lasting that isn't just about food, but it's about a whole new approach to supporting people? Uh, and so what this is doing now, or what we realised as part of this, OK, we need to redouble our efforts on engagement, but let's not just look mm -hmm. introspectively at ourselves. Mm -hmm. What we did, we thought, let's bring in someone to support us with this piece of work. So I'll talk to that now. If we can go to the next slide, please. So in June 2020, we commissioned the Centre for Local Economic Studies, or CLES, as they're more commonly known, to conduct a review of our community engagement function as a council. And they're an organisation very well respected across the country, have done lots of work uh, with different councils, all sorts of organisations on exactly this. And we, you know, we told them we've got ambitions, as you see here, to develop our community engagement approach to reach all of our citizens, the demographic groups across the borough, really foster a community spirit, enable citizens to become part of a collaborative approach to shape the borough. So that was their brief. And we worked really closely with them, uh, not just myself, Elliot, Mandy and Laura, but people across the council, our partners, our councillors. They did a real sort of deep dive into what it is we were currently doing. You know, they read a lot of stuff, read a lot of strategies, looked at a lot of data, spoke to a lot of people, a real kind of you know, root and branch about this is what you're doing currently in the house. This is what works. This is some of the strengths that you've got, some of this really good stuff other areas that you're not so strong on. You know, they worked with us to allow well, what would good look like in Hounslow. You know, you're, we don't, we didn't want, we made it very clear from the outset, we don't just want a template plonked on us that you've, you know, discussed with another council. We're unique. We want unique solutions that really work for us. Uh, and they brought with them as already well great examples of good practice, which could inform what we did, you know, good practice from other places around the country, but also good practice from around the world because of another remit of theirs, which gave them if we want some real 
part of the cliche but like blue sky thinking we want to be challenged we want really radical ideas they might not be right but we want to be thinking about that this isn't around tinkering around the edges of what we already do we something a bit more fundamental so what they did they did a lot of benchmarking real evaluation of all the stuff we already did they did a lot of interviews with people in the council officers members area forum chairs they did workshops and focus groups with residents and some of the mutual aid groups who emerged we've not spoke to and other partners to really find out what it was that people thought about the council, how they felt about engagement, things that was good, things that were not so good. Uh, and it was very candid. We've got reams and reams of qualitative data interviews. You know, it was very no holds barred. People didn't hold back. Some of it was quite difficult to read. Some of it was great and encouraging. But it's all good. It's all good stuff that we have to listen to. And then they also, what we've got here, mapping the partnership architecture within Hounslow to identify avenues for collaboration, stripping away the jargon. So what connections do we already have in the borough? What other organisations do we work with already or CBS groups that's really good? How can we capitalise on that? What's missing from, a, you know, when we extend as a council, what areas do we not have connections in? So helping us sort of geographically map those sort of connections. And their report is now finalised, and that will be made public very soon. Uh, and so if we go on to the next slide, please. So we've got here is just the diagram that they proposed to us, which we are taking on as this. These are the five steps that we now need to go through. And as we said at the beginning, this is a long journey uh and it will take many months and it will carry on going so it's not something we start six months down the line we finished here's our new approach to engagement big bang that's it for years no it continues and it continues and we're always learning so uh we're currently in sort of taking stock so there's another version of this diagram as well we're actually phases one two and three sort of loop around each other so we're taking stock at the moment. We've done that with the CLES report. We've done that with our own work. We're talking to different people and we're also listening now. So that's what this is about. That's why I'm talking to you now. We're going to be going out in other forums as well, we're going to be organising other events to talk to people, to listen to people. And part of that listening is more taking stock, hearing back what they said. And then it's reflecting on what we've learned. Uh, beginning to sort of pull together ideas of okay well this is what we could trial this this is what it could look like let's try that let's get some more feedback and the whole point is we do this with the community we particularly do this with the hard to reach groups we make sure we do speak to them we get their input we begin to develop ideas that works with them and then you go into the fourth stage which is co-producing these local engagement mechanisms so what will they actually look like and we'll come on to a little bit of that later but are the fundamental changes that when we look back in a few months time well this is something we're now doing which we never used to do and we'll be able to explain why we're doing it and we'll hopefully be able to demonstrate why it's really good and why people are engaging with it and then finally we have pass on the power it's one of our corporate values so this is the other part that this engagement isn't just the council doing things doing it better actually we're going to get to a place where groups, communities, whether that's geographical, whether that's demographic, whatever, they have ways themselves to engage, to discuss things, to make decisions. You know, there's some of the kind of the blue sky thinking stuff here uh, that we do generally pass on the power to community organisations to think about their own issues in their own areas, talk about things that work for them. And so if we can go to the next slide, please. So these are some of the sort of the, the tangible kind of proposed way forwards. So local conversations with residents to consider their priorities, support the needs of their communities, gain a better understanding of how residents are engaged. So that's what we're going to be doing quite soon in the next few weeks. So we're, we're quite good as a council in telling people about things that we want to talk about, you know, getting them in to talk about a certain policy, certain idea, holding set piece events, set piece meetings. What we're not so good at doing is actually going out to communities, talking to them on their own terms, on their own turf about what is it you want to talk about? How is it that you would like to be engaged? What is it that we need to understand about you? How do you view your, what's your identity? How do you view where you live? What matters to you locally? What do you associate yourself with? What don't you associate yourself with? Uh, and then number two, so consider how best to resource this ambition for community engagement. 
because we need to resource it in a way that reflects its importance. So it's not something we can do on the cheap with half an officer, right? But what would that look like? What resource do we need? We don't know. So that's something that will become clearer as the months progress. Uh, and there's all sorts of creative ways you can add extra resource into this. It isn't simply just about creating extra posts. There's lots of different ways we could do it, particularly further down the line by passing on the power. Uh, so then we have build on the council award links to shape engagement with the local community and informed decision making. So this is a point that Claire's made that of course we knew, but we need to give more thought to that often it's the councillors who not surprisingly know the most about their wards. They're day to day, the eyes and the ears on the streets around where they live. We need to connect to that better. They need to connect to us better. We need to sort of work as one around that. We need to embed that sort of approach. We need to support councillors in doing more engagement, whatever that might be, whether that's while we're still in the virtual world or when we can you know, return to normal. What sort of support do they need? What, you know, what's this sort of two-way feedback? And also how can we develop their role? And what are their thoughts on how their communities can help make decisions? And then number four is work with the community to reimagine our engagement mechanisms so they focus on areas on locations that people identify with. So sort of talking a bit to point one there and can enable co-production of local solutions for deeper engagement and better consultation. So that I guess in a nutshell is, it's not about one size fits all. It's not about saying, okay, as a council, we use this platform and we use this kind of meeting. We do that in Isleworth, we do it in Brentford, we do it in Chiswick, we do it in Felton. We do, no, we don't, right? We need to know what works in certain areas and create bespoke mechanisms for those or certain audiences or whatever. We need to create the engagement around the people we want to engage with in a way that suits them. Number five, facilitate opportunities for social action by ensuring that grant funding is available in the borough that works to support small scale community projects as well as larger interventions. So what we're talking about there is, you know, at the moment, very tangible example would be our work around the Thriving Communities Hounslow Response Fund. You know, something we do every year this year is targeted, not surprisingly, around the response to coronavirus. So how do we make that grant funding available? You know, a lot of that has already been going on over the past month or two, giving grants to some of these community organisations, voluntary groups, some we knew about, some we didn't, to support them, to empower and support the people that they help as part of our network, particularly as part of that piece of work around working more strategically with our voluntary sector, voluntary organisations thinking about other sources of support for them. How can we make them sustainable? You know, how do we all work together, you know, as one Hounslow in that way? Uh, and then number six, exploring methods of engagement where a degree of decision making is devolved to citizens. Do we want to explore particip participatory approaches? So, you know, decisions can be made differently for different areas. You know, this is the sort of thing that can feel a bit uncomfortable. We need to work through this. We need to think about this. But what can we hand over to residents for them to either participate in and to inform us or decide for themselves? And then number seven, explore structured discussion methods like assemblies, summits, representative panels to collaboratively shape a borough wide approach to one Hounslow and reframe the relationship between the public, the private and the voluntary sector. So this is the big, the big stuff, the big changes. So this is things about, you know, not just us thinking of a council and how do we best work with other people, but through the lens of what works for us. This is something that is about everyone or about everyone in an area. And it's very challenging to think about that. But what might that look like? What might a citizen assembly look like who has got some sort of delegated authority? And we don't know. Uh, and if we go on to the final slide, please. So this is, uh, I guess, a mixture of the, the last two where we go, we you know we list the five uh, sort of stages of our journey, like I said, some of them that loop together with some sort of tangibles of what, what we might be doing in those periods. So, you know, take stop, a short period of internal reflection, that's what we're doing. So we need to determine what we know, what we don't know about our communities. Well, we're a long way along that journey now, a lot of data. We're always going to be learning though, and beginning to identify those local leaders who perhaps we might not know about, perhaps have good connections, good engagement, influential, real force of positive change that we need to start working more closely with. Reflect on what approaches work well and what don't and what mechanisms are available for sharing local knowledge. So again, that's that stuff we're doing at the moment. 
listening. So a listening exercise, focus on understanding the many communities and their priorities. That's what we were going to with. This is part of that, speaking to area forums, but there will be, you know, there will be whatever we badge them up as local conversations, you know, over the next month to out in areas. We've got aligning with the Green Recovery Board concept of 15 minute neighbourhoods. What might that look like? So part of the recovery work around green recovery was the idea that people kind of live in this with a 15 minute bubbles around, apart from commuting for work and other things often, you know, that that's how they see their area that, you know, they, they want things all to be within that area. So why is our engagement fit that model as well? And if it did, what would that be? And then again, working further on local leader identification, then reflecting, so building consensus around one house low approach to relationships with citizens. So here we have prioritising social research, intelligence and insight mechanisms. So again, this is just all about the data really, and what else can we do to learn more and what do we do with that? data to make sure it's actually something practical that's a real benefit to us and informs this stuff. Ensuring recruitment practices attract both local people and younger people uh, and I would add in their BME that engage resources aligned with ambition. So this is about us as a council, you know, our workforce reflecting these ambitions, reflecting the borough, having staff ideally, you know, among the big cohort of many staff we already have that are from the people we would say going to say hard to reach. We don't like really saying that. It's not about being hard to reach. It's about we're not trying hard enough. We're not good enough at reaching them. Well, that would be great, right? If we had a whole council who's, you know, that kind of approach to engagement is at the heart of how we operate as, as a workforce. And then co-producting, so working with citizens to jointly develop engagement mechanisms. So, you know, building out from the community hub, which we spoke about earlier, to reach into neighbourhoods, connect with local identities, both digitally and in person, uh, and, you know, enable citizens to take a lead in shaping their local area, reviewing the current engagement structures, process funding mechanisms and necessary. Uh, and so really making people feel empowered and helping people to see the influence that they're having and then passing on the power. So we need to deepen these approaches then to and explore more innovative, braver, bolder methods to this. So trial some deliberative democracy methods, promote citizens voice, deepening the value of passing on the power testing out some new democratic approaches such as citizens assemblies such as a, you know a one Hounslow summit bringing people together to talk about all this stuff looking at representative panels uh, and you know all of this continues to be based on the one Hounslow because that overpins every overpins uh, runs through everything that we're doing around this so that is a quick uh, whistle stop tour through what is a very big complicated long journey but exciting journey fundamentally transforming how we engage with our residents like I said the next steps the CLES report will be published uh, shared with all the people who are involved in it I think that might have already happened we'll be promoting that through various channels to make people aware of that an implementation plan is being developed which puts a bit more meat on the bones and obviously the further in the future we go the more speculative that is but we want to remain sort of energized and brave and bold and actually do come up with something that, you know, from the outset of this with where we wanted to be. And that will be at your yeah, cabinet in December. And there'll be more communications about how people can get involved in this sort of stuff. And also, you know, it's it's an iterative process. So yes, we talk about this will be taking months, but we'll be learning all the way. And when we learn stuff, we'll stop doing it. So we've got things already in train that the council is engaging about, you know, about its new neighbour, about its town centres, about neighbourhoods, about place shaping. We need, we need to make sure that the lessons we're already learning about how to engage and reach some of you know the people we don't currently reach as well, that we start doing that now. So we're not just sitting on our hands, navel gazing, thinking about stuff. We're actually changing as we go, improving all the time, being able to more and more increasingly demonstrate genuine representation of our borough, gen, rep, increasingly demonstrate that we are hearing from our, all our diverse communities. And um, finally, I guess there is a we're not an island in this wanting to change engagement. The CCG want to improve their engagement. Other partners do as well. So we need to join up all that sort of stuff. Make sure we don't duplicate effort, contradict each other. Ideally, as a borough, as all the public sector partners, we all have a shared vision for this, of which this is a really important part. So I'll leave it at that. I'm aware this is about engagement and I've just you know, talked at you for about 15 minutes. Uh, but it'd be great now yeah, to hear if you have any any questions or any ideas, any thoughts. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much, you very Ben, much. for that, uh, that, that fascinating presentation. I thought it was absolutely, absolutely brilliant.
Um, as one of the one of the many area forum chairs who was interviewed as part of that process, it was it was really really fantastic to see what is that you've you've gone away and you've taken so much of the feedback that you've got, um, and and there's co there's concrete process emerging from this, and I'm keen to see where it goes. Um, I've got a couple of councillors who are about to come in, but first it's questions from residents. I know we've got one question uh, in at the moment, Mark. <coughs> I'm just going to publish this question here, which hopefully you can see um, Ben and Councillor Dunn. So this is a question from uh, Christine Dyer on behalf of the Isleworth Society. Um, with the current emphasis on community engagement, uh, I was surprised to see a revised statement of community involvement was put before Borough Council this week when it appears that uh, no prior consulting with the community was afforded. Is there still an opportunity for discussion and to input on the contents? OK, well, I'm going to have to apologise. I don't know what that is. That's not something that's come from our team. So that's something that unless you you know Councillor Dunn or anyone else, we'll have to take that away and make sure we get back on that. I, I can Please I can certainly comment on that. Um so and and so this the statement of community involvement was um published and agreed by Borough Council as part of the um suite of documents with the local plan review um and so i this steve might know more but looking at um the report itself it explains that um the government issued advice on the importance of um progressing local plans during the covid 19 pandemic so um and that the council has updated the statement of community involvement in accordance with government advice on social distancing. Um, so because of the way we, we sometimes carry out community engagement and involvement, that obviously has to change when we can't have um, meetings in person and so on. Um, so my understanding is that that it's it's been updated to reflect that. Um, but as I said, Steve might know more. Thanks, Catherine. Um, sorry, just to just to Peter on the uh, on the technical side of things before we continue. Just um, if you don't mind, just when we're not presenting, if you could just turn the presentation off, just so that I as chair can see all the councillors waiting to speak with their with, with their photos up. Thank you very much for that. Um, so Steve, did you want to come in from that following? Yep. OK. No, no, I think Catherine's, Catherine's covered all it. I was going to say, thank you. OK, great, cool. OK, I've got a couple of questions from councillors. So Unsa was the first to indicate that she wanted to speak. Hello, uh, Unsa Chowdhury, Councillor Foster Spring Grove. Glad I got my camera on first. Um, so say thank you for the presentation. It's quite interesting um, to see what you're uh, thinking about doing. I think it's really important to have a good engagement with the residents. I really like the idea of citizen assent citizen assembly if i can get it out um i think it'd be helpful for the people who are listening if you can explain what that means and what that involves and how you might look to develop that um i think you mentioned quite a lot about engaging with residents um but what i'd like to know is how exactly because you've in your uh, presentation you wrote about exploring but what does that actually mean what are you going to do um and what is the time frame for this you said that there is a it's a long plan um, but what would good look like? When would we like to see residents fully engaged? Um, and how do we encourage residents to take part? That this still is a question. Sorry, quick. I'll be quick. How do we encourage residents to take part who perhaps don't currently? How will we address that gap? And residents who do try to engage, how do we ensure that they're listened to? Okay, so I've got system assembly time frame how do you encourage people to get engaged i think there's probably a fourth one that i might have missed there let me know if there was uh so a citizen assembly that well that's a body of people who kind of you set up and there's all sorts of ways they could be set up and they could be 50 people could be 500 people who you would ask to you know deliberate on an issue and it could be that they sit there and they're the same all year and they might consider various issues or it could be that you just create them for a certain issue there's no set thing but it's basically where you get a group of people together and ask them to deliberate on something 
And again, it's not a set in stone thing, but you, you can decide how much you will have to sort of agree with what they do and follow it, or whether it's just going to be indicative and instructive in what you kind of do. But it's really a way of passing an issue to a group of people to get their thoughts, get fresh ideas. You ideally want it perhaps to be representative. So choose people who are very different, almost at random, I guess, who just but who represent the borough and so on. So that that's that in a nutshell. And you know, these are ideas. So it's really important to stress at this stage that we talk about these things and we might mention them in the presentation. They're just things that we might want to look at. You know, it really is. We're really at the beginnings of this sort of thing. On the time frame, so like it, it started now, and as I sort of said at the beginning, there isn't a period where we're going to say, right, that's done now. You know, and that and that's going to be July. But we do anticipate this will run into well into next year. I know. I think the work plan that goes to cabinet has, you know, some things that would might be you know autumn next year. But as I and you know that's to be agreed and that's all fluid and as I stressed this is an iterative thing so we're going to be improving things as we go we're going to be developing things as we go uh, but I think we you know we could be looking at six months to a year I suppose where we can say this is where we have definitely got stages four and five now and we've spoke to a lot of people and we've got some real concrete things but that's not a, a commitment that's just kind of what we're thinking at the moment but it's it depends what people say right we're listening we're taking stock uh, and getting people involved. I mean, there's obviously lots of ways we can reach out to people through our own communications channels to actually going out to where people are to, you know, things like Hounslow Matters through our networks. You know, so as part of this is building more of, you know, better connections to community and voluntary groups who can reach all sorts of people. So we, we, we're connecting people through that. And it depends. Do we want are we wanting to get the people of Isleworth involved or are we wanting to get people involved with a certain age group or are we wanting to get people involved who have got a certain health condition or a, you know another demographic uh, so it really depends what it would be but one of the positives from coronavirus is it's really made us improve our communications channels we've got a lot of hyper local channels now we've got 100 odd community champions as we call them who have got connections across whether it's the, the next door app or WhatsApp groups or Facebook communities. We've got lots of ways in now into lots of people. So it would totally depend on who is the target audience, but we're getting better and better along with engagement with reaching people. So there's lots of ways and we'd, we'd hope we'd be able to reach every audience that we need, but that's all part of this work. Apologies if there was another, well, I mean, I don't want to come, want to come back on any of those or, and I think there might've been another question that I've not addressed. There was another question which was about residents who are already engaged. How are we ensuring that we are listening to them? What are we doing to let them know that what they say actually does matter and they do actually have an input? It's not just them giving their ideas and suggestions and nothing coming from it. Yeah, that, so you hit a really important nail on the head there, which is what we are not as good at as we need to be. And it varies from thing to thing. So there's all sorts of projects that people are engaged with. But what we often don't do is the kind of, you know, you said we did or you know, closing the feedback loop to use the jargon. And I've heard both through this work, but also other work I've been doing with the Integrated Care Partnership, where public patient reps will say, well, we came to this event and you didn't tell us what happened. And if someone commits time to something, we, sh need, we should tell them what was the output of that. So with the Claire's work, for instance, everyone who's been involved in this should have been in contact with Claire's should have had stuff shared with them. Part of this is absolutely clo always closing that loop. Part of our culture engagement has to be right. Who did get involved with that? Make sure we take their details and let them know what came of it. Right, that's so important. So we're already doing that to varying degrees. So it could be like like I said with the Claire's work, follow up emails, sharing the report. Could be with other things we're doing about town centres or something where people might fill out a questionnaire we've got all of their information and then what we will do is update them of this is what came from that or it could be emails from council officers to specific individuals they know about a certain issue to oh by the way i know you came to the, you you spoke about that this is what we're doing we did it you know so through the climate change action plan there was a lot of that sort of stuff so there's lots of ways we do it what we just need to do is make sure that we do do it and we do it consistently 
but it's a really important point that you raise. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. I'm going to now come to Richard Easton for his question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Salman. Um, uh, uh, Richard Easton, um, uh, Labour and Cooperative Councillor for Austley and Spring Grove. Sorry, I wasn't um, quite uh, here for the uh, introductions earlier. Um, my uh, question really is about the proposed way forward and looking at the um, last point there about reframing the relationship with the public, private and voluntary sectors. Uh, what strikes me as missing there is our trade unions. Um, and I think that's especially important for a for a Labour Council such as ourselves um, that we uh, and um, and during um, uh, the tough economic times that we're in at present. Um, I think we should be making sure that we are engaging with our trade unions um, and one of the differences for Hounslow Borough from many others is that we don't actually have a uh, borough based trades council where um, most of um, the other London boroughs do. Um, I'm sure some of my uh, colleagues will be able to inform me later why, why that is, but um, that um, strikes me as quite a, uh, quite a gap. And um, so I'd like to see that uh, picked up as part of the plan. Thank you. OK, well, I've noted that and also just so you're aware and you probably are anyway, but we'll, I work around recovery and on the recovery plan, we one of the recovery board members was Sam Gurney, who is a senior senior uh, trade union representative of London and the South East. And we're still in touch with him and actually we're continuing to work with trade unions around our work on like, aviation communities and calling for support for you know, people impacted by coronavirus, the downturn in economic stuff. So they are connections we have, but I'm sure you're right that we need to build on that. Uh, and I've made a note. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. I'm going to, um, I, as, as I think there are probably no more questions on this item, we do have uh, a couple of other items to get through and lots of questions. We're gonna thank Ben very much for, for everything that he, he said and, um, um, and lots to take away, lots to think about there. Thank you very much. We'll, uh, we'll, now, we'll now move on to the next item. Before we go to the discussion item, I did promise I would bring in my trusty vice chair, Mel Collins, for his update. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Chair. I'm sorry about, uh, I, uh, I got cut out of my previous meeting and couldn't get into yours either. So uh, <laughs> I must have been a naughty boy somewhere. Anyway, good evening, everybody. Yeah, uh, one of my roles as vice chair is to uh, make sure that uh, I attend um, a consultation uh, events before they go to to the public consultation. So uh, this this year we've talked about uh, climate emergency uh, briefly, and that that came to the consultation panel before it went out. Um, the allotment strategy was another one that we looked at before it went out to the public. Uh, for review and I'm sure that strategy is, if it hasn't already been published, is, is on the verge of. Um, like the chair, I, I was also interviewed uh, for the piece of work which we've just discussed uh, and also like the chair, I joined um, a chairs and vice chairs discussion on community in, engagement because uh, I'm very passionate about that. I think um, if you don't talk to your community, then why are you bothering to be a councillor? Um, it's it's just so important uh, in whatever level it is. And so I'm glad that we've got this review, and I'm sure at the end of it, chair, um, it it it'll it'll serve to be a a good caveat going going forward. Um, the last of the uh, consultations that we looked at was on the proposals for future changes at um, Charlton House and the surrounding area and Convent Way. Um, also, obviously, in my role as vice chair, and particularly in this virtual age, uh, I've tried to liaise with the chair to ensure that the um, area forum has got back online as soon as it possibly could. Uh, and to ensure that we got topics on the agenda uh, and, and fair play to the chair, to Mark Frost and to Kay Duffy for getting tonight's events on 
uh, with the with the topics that we've got on the table for discussion. So that's my brief roundup, Chair, and I'm most grateful for you allowing me to talk. Thank you very much uh, for that, Mel, and absolutely echo your thanks to the officers uh, for everything that they've they've done tonight. In fact, there is one officer I want to thank particularly, and uh, and I'm going to take the opportunity to do so now. Um, uh, I don't wish to embarrass him, but Mark Mark Frost, it is your last ever IBAF, and as chair and on behalf of past chairs such as Tony Lukey and, and, and Mel Collins, I, I want to thank you for everything you've done in helping us facilitate these. I don't know if you, you want to say a few words, Mark. Um, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure, Councillor. Uh, I think it's five years, possibly, uh, I've been attending the forum and uh, some of them have enjoyed more than others, uh, but all of them have never failed to be interesting. And, uh, and it's been great to see that opportunity for people to engage uh, directly with councillors and, and, and officers. Um, and also been really good for officers in my team to get that exposure um, to, to, this, to, to that level of decision making as well. So, it's, yeah, it's, it's, been a real, it's been a real privilege. And uh, yeah, thank you for that, that comment, uh, Chair. That was, that, that was lovely. Thank you, Mark. Your your work's not over yet. Of course, we've still got uh, several more discussions and questions to run through. But uh, let's hope uh, let's hope we give you an easy final meeting. So I'm going to move on now to our second uh, big discussion item of the evening, and that is uh, an update on the climate emergency. Now, um, as part of that, as part of that, I wanted to also for us to take into account in this in this discussion on the climate emergency the 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 streetscape plan and the low traffic neighbourhoods. I, I know this is something that many residents have asked me: Can we have this on the agenda of the next Isleworth and Brentford area forum? And I absolutely think it you know it is a very important part of the engagement with residents uh, as part of this process that uh, that we do discuss it. So. Um, I want to hand over back to uh, to Catherine Dunn um, as the uh, as the cabinet member for communities and climate change, um, who will also be uh, working on this item with Paul Trainer, um, interim head of traffic, to present this item. Hi. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> so many things happening at once. Um, yes. Great. So I think the slides are going to come up. Um, in a sec, uh, but I'll start talking anyway. Um, so I'm sure hopefully everyone is aware that uh, we as a council, we declared a climate emergency, as did lots of other councils, obviously um, the UK Parliament, the um, London Assembly and, and various other bodies um, last year. Uh, so we I think I submitted my motions for a council in June last year, um, and that was unanimously supported uh, by councillors to say, yes, we acknowledge that there is a climate emergency and we have to do something about it. Um, so that, that put us in, in one of the, the first, um, not the very first, but we were, we were one of the first um, councils um, in, in London and, and in the country to do that. And of course, lots of others um, have followed since. Um, obviously, th th that's a, a position uh, th to, to say we take that seriously, um, but then we, we have to do something about it. Um, and I committed uh, at that meeting, which, which was well supported um, by members of the public as well, who turned up in those days when that could happen. Um, uh, so I committed that that we would um, have a, put together an action plan um, to see what we could do as a council to both um, reduce our own carbon emissions with an aim of becoming carbon neutral by 2030, um, but also very importantly uh, to look at the wider carbon emissions from the borough. Um, for, from our residents, businesses, um, everything connected to the borough. Um, the importance of that comes when, when you actually look at um, the, you know, how much the council itself contributes um, is, is only about 5% um, of, of the whole borough. Um, so brilliant, thanks. So we've got the, the baseline um, slide coming up here. Um, so basically, for, 
just to give it a little bit more, um, we, I mean, we did a lot of engagement actually as, a, as an example of some really good engagement and consultation that we did um, both before we put the initial plan together um, at the end of last year and then the consultation on the plan itself, um, which started in um, the beginning of this year and uh, then went on for a few months. It got a little bit delayed then because of COVID-19 for the obvious reasons um but we did we we incorporated uh, people's comments and ideas and um, we had a lot of engagement from school children which was absolutely great and i think that was one of the real things that i i thought was great about it was that we actually um looked at how we could engage school children and, and did and did a separate almost you know separate consultation that was geared towards young people um so that was really good. And then we we the finalised plan um, we passed um, at Borough Council, I think, um, in July this year or Cabinet. Maybe we weren't meeting as Borough Council then. Oh, anyway, um, but the point is we didn't just sit and wait for that to happen. We the work got going um, uh, almost straight away and, and continued, of course, to build on things that we had already been doing in this area. Um, so, oh yeah, look, it's on the slide. I should have read, read that. So the Climate Emergency Action Plan was adopted by Cabinet in July, um, following the public engagement and consultation programme. Um, so looking, of course, if we're going to um, show that we have reduced um, carbon emissions, we need to be able to measure them. It's the very first rule of everything and we need to know where we're starting from. Um, so BASE, that's the De Government Department for Business, Energy uh, and Industrial Strategy, have published um, updated uh, local authority and regional um, carbon emissions statistics for 2018. So a couple of years out of date, but that's the way these uh, things are. Um, so we saw that for Hounslow, um, the, the wider borough emissions, so all the emissions associated with the borough um, had reduced compared to the previous year by um, 36.5 kilotons of carbon dioxide. Um, the main reason for this is due to a change in fuel mix for electricity generation. Um, so we now obviously more of our electricity um, is being um, generated from renewable energy and less of it from fossil fuels, coal and gas. However, um, we have also seen that um, domestic gas use and industrial and commercial gas use has, has increased and emissions from that has increased. Um, and we can see that the per capita emissions, so the emissions per person living in the borough has decreased from 3.8 tonnes to 3.7 tonnes. Um, we're also doing some work, obviously, to look at the, the council's direct emissions, those ones that we have the most control over. Um, we are using a tool, um, a toolkit that's um, recently been issued by the Local Government Association. Um, so we're doing that work now on the 2019-20 data and that will be reported next year. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so as well as looking at so, so looking now to, to, to council emissions, well actually a mixture of both. Um, as well as looking at that baseline for the borough, um, what we've we, what we started doing is kind of energy audits of buildings in the borough. Um, so obviously our own council buildings um, that we have control over, schools that we either have some control over or, or very good links with. Um, but also to where, where we can, looking at private properties, um, especially private homes in the borough. Um, and to be able to do something about these, then obviously we need money. Um, so, and, and we were very honest when, when we published our plan that, you know, we do not have the money um, to be able to do everything that we want to do. And obviously that's a situation that has only got worse um, with COVID-19. Um, what we need to do is, is look for that funding elsewhere um, to ensure that we can carry out the work that needs to be done. So on this slide, there's 
Um, I was going to talk through them all, but I don't know if people want me to do that. Um, just I'll just give a couple of examples, maybe. Um, so the Green Homes Grant, hopefully that is something that, that people have heard of. It's, it's been, um, that was launched fairly recently in October. Um, so there's two parts to that. There's the part that um, you all need to know about, um, which is the um, the one that's available to to um, homeowners. Um, that we're promoting that to to residents. So if you if you don't own your own home, if if you rent privately, that might be something you want to talk to your landlord about, um, because these are grants that are available to homeowners. Um, to be able to increase the energy efficiency of their own home. Um, then there's um, also a pot of money that's available to local authorities um, to bid for. And instead of rather than just doing this ourselves, we joined with a West London consortium of eight local authorities. Um, and in the first tranche of that, we were awarded um, £4.78 million for this. And this is where that that kind of looking at, at properties and and trying to um, pinpoint the ones that, and this is private properties in the borough trying to pinpoint the ones that would benefit most um, from this grant, um, especially low income households. Um, we will be targeting those those in order to inform people and help them to to get hold of this money to be to be able to make improvements to their the energy efficiency of their homes. Um, so moving on, um, there's also the Green Investment Programme, um, which was announced by the government. Um, so under that, we've got two things. There's the Public Sector Decarbonisation Scheme, and Hounslow's got in two bids for this. Um, so the first bid was um, for our schools to target 26 schools um, to install interventions for decarbonising heat uh, such as heat pumps, solar panels, um, LED upgrades, new windows and doors and so on. So we've put in a bid for £6 million for that. And then we're preparing a second bid, um, which focuses on our corporate buildings, 30 corporate buildings such as leisure centres, public halls and libraries. And again, to install those energy efficiency measures and um, the deadline for that's December. And we're hoping to put in a bid for £8 million. Um, and then finally on the slide, we've got the there's the social housing decarbonisation decarbonisation fund demonstrator, um, which is to encourage innovation in delivery at scale um, and for for decarbonising and and putting energy efficiency measures into social housing. Um, so I don't know if we have to bid for that or if we just get an allocation from government, um, but we'll certainly be making the most of whatever we're able to get our hands on. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, so more updates um, now from our Climate Emergency Action Plan programme. Um, so we have completed or uh, uh, updated a district heat mapping report and applied for funding um, to complete our borough-wide energy master plan. Um, and this fed into the, the local plan review um, um, to assist the development and delivery of heat network opportunities in the borough. Um, so I can't really actually remember, but we've identified a number of sites around the borough that would be suitable for um, implementing heat networks. Um, in terms of um, new council house building, um, we're trying to make that as as um, low carbon as possible. Um, so the the development of Frank Tell Court is 83% compliant. Um, the Everglades is a um, development of 33 units, which is 94% compliant. And then our first um, zero carbon development is um, in the planning stages. Um, and that's the one to be built, hopefully, on Orchard Road Car Park. Um, I believe planning application for that has been submitted um, and a decision is due this winter. Um, then um, there's other work we're doing there on smart metering, um, a campaign um, 
called the Less CO2 Campaign um, to enable schools to develop their own climate emergency action plans. We have um, an aim for every school in the borough to, um, to develop a climate emergency action plan and adopt zero carbon targets. Um, and then there's the Better Homes, Better Health program um, through Groundwork that, that we who we've been working with for, for several years now. Um, they used to go around to people's homes, I believe, to, to see what um, energy um, efficiency measures could be implemented. Obviously, with, with lockdown and coronavirus, um, they're now doing that virtually. Um, as you can see, they've um, carried out 187 virtual visits, I think, and 164 telephone consultations. Um, then when it comes to transport, um, this is a really important uh, part of the programme. Um, I think in, when you look at the wider borough emissions, transport um, actually accounts for about 30%. Um, or is it more? Actually, <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing. It's more than that. Mark's going to correct me at some point, um, or maybe before. Um, so that that it, it accounts for a huge amount of uh, anyway of of the carbon emissions in the borough. So if we can um, encourage a shift to greener transport, um, whether that be greener energy, and uh, as well as obviously encouraging more people to um, use active travel, so so walking and cycling. Um, it's, it's really important and it's actually it's a key part of, of reducing the carbon emissions of the borough. Um, so as you'll know, we've ramped up the provision of the street space schemes um, that we're going to come on to, um, the school streets and so on. Um, we are working on our um, workplace parking levy business case that's been a little bit delayed because of COVID, but we are we're going ahead with that, um, which would um, enable us to raise money from businesses that provide parking spaces in the borough um, and, and use that money then ring fence towards transport improvements. Um, and we're also um, uh, trying, we're, we're transferring our fleet over to electric vehicles. Um, so that's the council's vehicles and um, also encouraging private electric vehicles um, through um, the provision of charging points installation um, for private residents throughout the borough. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, on um, the so on the culture change and governance program, um, we are working to develop a green new deal for London and to lobby government um, to secure. Um, our asks in terms of um, climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, we set up a climate and clean air community reference group, um, which, uh, which I have the pleasure of chairing. That's met four times to date to discuss the plan development and implementation. And that looks at our climate emergency action plan and our um, uh, air quality action plan. Um, we've got a communications plan to raise awareness, encourage net zero lifestyles, um, which maybe Ben actually might know more about. I don't know if he's still on the call. Um, and then we, yeah, we did, we took part in London Repair Week um, in October, um, which encourages people obviously to repair and reuse things rather, rather than getting rid of things as, as waste. Um, also on waste, um, we are rolling out improved recycling facility, um, especially in flats. Um, and obviously, we adopted a new bulky waste collection policy uh, again to to um, so that we can have better control over over waste. Um, and then finally, on greening the borough and increasing resilience, we've got two bids submitted to the Mayor's Grow Back Greener Fund. Um, uh, we are carrying out a green infrastructure, green infrastructure study, nature recovery plan and urban tree plan. Um, so that's commissioned and drafts to be ready by December. Um, and we've also uh, been successful in securing funding and being the lead partner to deliver the SUDS improvement. I am going <laughs> to... Admit, I don't know what that is, so someone's going to have to tell me, Mark. 
<laughs> which is a terrible note to, to finish on, but I am going to finish there. Um, <laughs> there were just too many acronyms, Mark. I was looking them up anyway. <laughs> Um, we, we do that on, on purpose, Councillor Douglas. So if I chair, if I can, it says it starts with sustainable urban drainage. Um, and you're almost right that's on the That's really carbon. exciting. <laughs> yeah, the transport carbon emissions are 34%. I was there. I said 30 or 40. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Brilliant. So that was a real race through um, a lot of the things that we've been doing. Um, and um, now I'm going to hand over uh, to Paul Trainer, who's going to talk more about the Street Space programme. Thank you very much, Councillor Don. Um, so the Street Space programme uh, very much uh, dovetails in with, with a lot of what Councillor Dunn's just talked through there in terms of the Climate Emergency Action Plan, but it also supports a number of the other council's key aims such as our transport strategy, the health agenda, and some of our air quality aims as well. Sorry, is, is the presentation coming up? So the, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick overview whilst, whilst we're loading up the presentation. So the purpose of, 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 of my giving it tonight is very much just to give you a, a bit of a flavour about why, why the Street Space Programme has, has come into being, what that programme looks like, how it's funded, I'll be talking through the specific Isleworth and Brentford schemes uh, and, their, and their objectives. And then I'd like to focus, if I can, on the process that the council's following here that was articulated at, uh, at Cabinet a couple of weeks ago around the interim and the final reviews and how we're assessing the, the trial measures that are, uh, that are currently being implemented. All right, uh, next slide, please. So the, the why question, so, why, why are Hounslow Council pursuing the, the streets-based programme? So this very much reflects some central government statutory guidance that came out in, uh, in early May in direct response really to the pandemic, um, expecting local authorities to make significant changes to their, to their highway network. And this was to accommodate some of the, uh, the changes in, in, in people's, uh, people's travel patterns and to try and lock into those really. So, you know, the, the, the change in behaviour was around greater levels of walking and cycling, where we were seeing a lot more cleaner air. Um, so the, the purpose of this statutory guidance really, really was to try and capture some of, the, some of those benefits. Uh, so it, it really was sort of a, a once in a generation opportunity to do that. But I think the important thing to note from that statutory guidance that we received was around how quickly we as a council were expected to respond to that. And it, and it was those exact words as swiftly as possible and in any event within weeks. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to that central government guidance, we also had the mayor of London street space programme. Uh, he was certainly developing here to make it easier for people to keep those social distancing measures to encourage people to continue to walk and cycle and enable them to do that safely. And we saw a, a number of people here dropping back from or, or being advised against taking public transport. So, you know, one of the knock-on effects of that could have been quite a sharp increase in car usage. So again, we were being encouraged here to, to deliver measures to try and offset and any of that potential increase. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so the council must pay due regard to that statutory guidance, and that is exactly what we did in, in, in addition to the the mayoral transport directives uh, and as, as I touched on at the very beginning so these schemes not only will they just meet some of that statutory guidance but they'd also touch on a number of the council's uh, key aims and priorities here so th there was a, it was a real opportunity to do something different um, and before I go into I'll, I'll say it but I am going to say this several times through the presentation that all the schemes that have been implemented today they are trials you know, they are not permanent schemes. They have been delivered in, in a slightly different way, but the consultation on all those schemes is, is still live, still ongoing, and I'll be encouraging you as we go to, to feed into that if, if anybody has any concerns. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, one of the questions that we uh, frequently get uh, is, is around how how is the programme being developed? Uh, so the council's looking at delivering this in, in phases, 
So currently on the go are what we are terming phase one and phase two. Uh, there was a phase three considered at, uh, at Cabinet recently, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm, I'm purely going to focus on those those initial two phases. There's a rundown there of the schemes that are included in those, including bus lanes, sustainable transport schemes, school streets, low traffic neighbourhoods, uh, footway widenings in specifically around town centres and also a number of cycle improvements. So and just to give you a flavour, we're about two thirds of the way through that programme, certainly in terms of phase one and two so far, and the intention is to complete that by the end of March 2021. OK, next slide, please. So the funding is something that we get asked for. Oh. All right. So how were those phase one and two schemes uh, informed? So there was a, a number of exercises that we went through. So these weren't just picked off the top of our heads. So we did a consultation exercise with the borough in May and June of this year. And an awful lot of the ideas, uh, thoughts and desires came, came through that consultation. We had over 4,000 responses to that, which was great. Um, there was a number of shovel ready schemes that the council already had where we carried out either feasibility or detailed design. Um, we also looked at other schemes which comply with both the objectives of the programme could be delivered as well as those schemes put forward by other key stakeholders, as well as the consultation, such as schools. A lot of schools came forward to us with issues at that point. OK, next slide, please. Funding. Sorry, that, that was that was a slide I was expecting on the previous one. Uh, so uh, the council has been successful at this point in uh, being granted a, a number of funding awards, both from Department for Transport and Transport for London. They are all detailed there. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through each and every one. You can, you can read those at your leisure. But in total, uh, the council success has brought in just under £1.9 million to deliver this programme. OK, next slide, please. So in terms of why, why we were successful in getting the £1.9 million, um, so TfL had a, a clear criteria here for how they assess those bids when we, when we put in to win them. And they were assessed effectively under three headings. Um, so deliverability. So did these can did these measures have an element of community support and political support, as well as does the council have a, a good track record of delivery? There was a consideration about the location and the borough where they were in. You know, was social distancing an issue? Were we getting overcrowding in 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 some of those town centre locations? And was that likely to pose some kind of safety concerns? And then finally, the value of the bids that we put in, uh, looking at their public health uh, and also impacts on sustainable movements in terms of walking, cycling and taking public transport. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the measures that we've introduced in, in, in Isleworth and Brentford, so there's 10 low traffic neighbourhoods or access restrictions. I, I appreciate not all 10 of these are, are in, but they are certainly in phases one and two. There are seven school streets there and which are listed, some cycle lanes and a footway widening proposal on, on Windmill Road. Now, each of these schemes will be funded out of that, uh, that 1.9 million. Not only the, uh, the interim measures that have been put in and, and the temporary measures, and, and they are temporary measures that have been put in. You, you'll see there's a whole variety of uh, red and white barriers coming up ac across the borough. Um, but it also covers the uh, office of time that's involved as well as the, the the enforcement that we're carrying out. So a lot of these schemes are going in with camera enforcement now as well uh, to ensure that they uh, they deliver on their objectives. OK, ne next slide, please. So I'll, I'll give a, a, a quick run through uh, the local scheme. So in terms of the bus lane schemes that have been delivered, a lot of these were around just simply changes in hours. Uh, so the ideal was was to move them to 24-7 uh, bus lanes or at the very least seven to seven hours of operations in order to just try and encourage more bus use and more people to cycle down those lanes rather than taking private vehicles. Uh, there's, there's five bus lane extensions here within, uh, within the IBAF area. OK, next slide, please. So as well as bus lanes, school streets have formed a quite a large part of this programme 
And this, this again is all focused on creating safe spaces, both for children, carers and parents, uh, pick up and drop off times around the schools. Uh, most of those come with uh, some exemptions there for both school staff, residents, visitors, deliveries, quite an exercise there in, in, in agreeing the white lists and, 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 and ensuring that the people that need access here have, have got it through those areas. Um, but there's, there's seven schools in total that we've, some of those have been delivered, some of them are currently being delivered. Uh, okay, next slide please. So there's a number of the uh, the pop-up cycle lanes, which hopefully a number of you have, have seen and, and hopefully used. Um, again, th th these are primarily designed to, to support cyclists on, on some of our more major routes. Um, a lot of them have been delivered with the with the ones that you see on, on the image there on the right. Uh, and there's, there's four of these particular measures in, in the IBAF area. Um, the, the north side of Twickenham Road has, has already been delivered. I know the south side still to follow. And we've also come up with a, a footway widening proposal on, on Windmill Road um, and we are just finalising the detailed design of that now. OK, next slide, please. And then the low traffic neighbourhoods. Now, these are where we are seeking to uh, protect those local communities and try and capture some of the benefits that they've seen around re reduced flows in traffic or uh, greater ability for walking and cycling. Um, they are considered necessary um in, and we but we are seeing a, you know some community concern here over the implementation of some of these whether that's in terms of displaced traffic or the exact choice of measures that have been put in and again i will just urge you know those measures that have been put in they are trials and i'll talk about how how they're assessed and how we'll move forward in, in the up and coming slides but there are 10 10 of the low traffic neighborhood or access restrictions in in this area and they're and they're listed on the slide and there's an, also a number of other schemes still to come okay next slide please so this is a bit that i i really wanted to uh, to draw on so you've you, you've seen the number of schemes that have gone in now they have gone in as temporary measures so the, the obvious question is, how are, how are the community being consulted here around each of those? What is their opportunity to have a say? And how are we going to make the determination whether these measures have been a success, whether they need changing or amending, or actually whether they need removing? So we are proposing uh, two elements of review. The first one will be an interim review once that scheme has been in for a period of three to four months. Now, we are using an independent uh, traffic consultant to do those reviews of a number of sources of data that, that are detailed there around, whether it's around traffic count data, whether it's around walking or cycling data, if we've got that available, right through to some, uh, some really innovative data here that we're, we're looking at from both O2 and MasterCard. Uh, and if we're able to get some of, the, some, of that, some of that data as well to talk about how, how businesses are impact or how, what spend on our high streets is looking like will be really useful. But I think the the biggest element in there is community feedback. So once everybody has had their say on on the portal, and I'll I'll, I'll detail that in more on on on, on the next slide, um, we'll be looking around community acceptance uh, and whether any concerns have been voiced during that during the interim period, and then once if the scheme is then taken forward and carried on with. At the end of that six month initial trial period, we will, we will undertake a final review of all that traffic data. Again, we'll be looking at all the consultation feedback and we'll be putting that forward to a, a chief officer decision in, in, in consultation with the lead member to make a decision around what is what are the next steps with those schemes. OK, next slide, please. But. When, when I talked there about, about about resident engagement and feedback, this is where it is really important. Uh, so I appreciate these measures have gone in as, as trial measures. They do take a little bit of time uh, to settle down. You know, if you are restricting access, people will take some time here to, to, to work out their alternative routes or where else they, they, they might travel. Um, so the, the public views may very well change over time. There may, it, there may initially be some concerns that do settle once traffic patterns have settled down, but no matter where we are in there, every scheme is still currently out to consultation and you can access those consultations through the citizen space platform there and to have your say and each and every scheme is detailed in there and we are really, really keen to encourage everybody to feed into those 
uh, those consultations. So we've already received over 3000 uh, bits of communication on those schemes. Uh, they are mixed in terms of views. So, some are some are quite well supported, some less so. Um, you know, we, we're not going to hide from that. But the, the the important thing again is that we'll, we'll be carrying out those interim reviews, assess how they're doing. If there's anything fundamental there that is not working, then we will take action, whether that's either to remove them or to amend and change. And then after six months, we will then once the consultation period has has ended, we will assess those schemes again, do a complete review before making any decisions. And every single resident that has written to us through that through that trial will get feedback in terms of what is what are the proposals. But the other the other thing I think to uh, to focus on is each of those independents, both the interim and the final reviews, all elements of those will be published. So everybody will be able to see exactly on what, exactly what basis the council here is intending to make a decision. OK, next slide, please. So uh, I've seen a number of bits of communication uh, coming to the council around have we considered equalities in terms of input in these schemes and there is a draft equalities impact assessment available for the whole of the streets based program uh, and that has actually changed a number of the schemes that we've delivered to date making provisions for blue badge access uh, and, and certainly parking in, in, in those key shopping areas so you can see most of the schemes that we've put in here have, have been quite tailored around around ensuring and maintaining some some degree of access here and that those with protected characteristics aren't impacted by by, by the measures that we have been putting in that is it's a statutory duty on the council to to accommodate that and it has certainly been delivered here with this program okay next slide please so there's a final couple here um I, I won't dwell on them too long so the air quality one there quite an interesting one so it shows you what air quality has looked like this year in comparison with 2019. Um, you can see there, there is quite a significant reduction there or improvement, if you like, in, in, in air quality. Um, but, you know, I think lock, lockdowns had quite an impact, certainly in terms of the first drop. And I would expect that uh, to replicate again, given, a, uh, given that we've just gone back into that environment yet again. But we have quite a network of diffusion tubes right the way across the borough here where we are capturing air quality data and we'll be using that to understand the changes that have happened on our network and also the impacts that some of the street space measures might have had in, in either improving or uh, or changing the air, uh, the air quality outcomes. OK, next slide, please. And then as a final slide, um, I have actually captured here. There was some some concern here around traffic displacement is a, a phrase I've heard quite a bit since since starting with Hounslow um, and you know local uh, low traffic neighbourhoods. You know the you are you are going to move some traffic around. Some of it will be displaced um, and it, it's about understanding where that's been displaced to and what the impacts of that have been. Um, I've got I've got I've got one example that I will run through whilst I'm here. So uh, there was some concern expressed to us around uh, St John Street here, um, St John's Road, as as a result of some of the uh, low traffic neighbourhoods we'd implemented on the adjacent roads there, um, and the concern was talking about increases in speed, increases in traffic flow. So quite rightly so, we went out and we we did a count last month in in October 2020 and compared that to a baseline date. The last time we'd counted on St John's Road was in May 2017. Um, and whilst I appreciate the community concern that's been raised, you know, that evidence says that, you know, supports the fact that both the mean speeds and the 85th percentile speeds haven't increased. They have they've stayed broadly the same, if anything, slightly reduced. And equally, the traffic flows that are on St John's Road now, again, are actually slightly down and they are significantly down on a Saturday and a Sunday. Uh, but on, on the Monday to Friday average, it's only slightly reduced from what it was in 2017. But it's important here that the community come back, voice their concerns and allow us to respond, allow us to gather the evidence and understand where those uh, those concerns are so that we can address them. OK, thank you, Chair. That's that's the end of my presentation. I welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Paul, for that excellent presentation. Uh, I think yeah, Councillor uh, Collins has two questions when I'm allowed to speak. Yes, please. yes, thanks, Mel. I'll come to councillors' questions after we've done public questions, as 
um, as we have lots of public questions first. And I think it's uh, very important, especially in the, the, the theme of public engagement that we've been talking about today, and especially seeing as this item has been discussed plenty by councillors, but this is the, really the first time we've had a, a public meeting on it due to the, the lockdown and the emergency arrangements under which these uh, these processes were taken. So I'm going to very much focus on, on public questions first. I also want to remind everyone that we have th this meeting ends at 8 p.m. And uh, it may be that if, if, if all the questions are, are taken up on this item, we might not have time to go forward to general questions afterwards. So it, it, members, please do bear that in mind when asking your questions after the public has had their turn to speak, because we have a lot to get through in um, in 50 minutes, 49 minutes. Uh, Mark, please, can you take us through some of the, the public questions and answers? Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Now, obviously, I am the APO here, but I'm also the lead officer for both of these items. Uh, so I've just had a quick chat, uh, text with uh, Councillor Dunn, and I'll actually answer some of these as I take them. So that may speed us up as well. Um, so first of all, we've got two questions here from um, uh, Barbara Strijek Ogra and uh, a resident uh, asking about um, how we can ensure that new developments are as close as possible to zero carbon. And I've just popped those in the published uh, point. Of course, we do encourage all developers to uh, have um, stringent measures to reduce the carbon emissions associated with their with their developments. And certainly the direction of the new London plan, um, which is currently um, uh, going through the various processes, uh, is very much to encourage uh, and actually enforce that that arrangement and we're actually waiting for the London plan to go through its process uh, to see where that leads us before we can then uh, change any of our local <laughs> policies but we do have some provisions in place to start developing supplementary planning documents to strengthen uh, our ability to um, uh, support low carbon and zero carbon development. Even at this current time though, any development that is uh, proven to be uh, not zero carbon for any reason has to pay a carbon offset fund and actually as part of the climate emergency action plan process we increased the cost of a tonne of carbon uh, dioxide uh, by uh, almost uh, 50, over 50 percent actually from 60 pound per tonne to 95 pound per tonne and it seems likely that the London plan will further strengthen that. So uh, in effect we, we try and create that uh, net zero carbon through the offset fund and, uh, as, as well as through stringent measures to reduce uh, emissions from the development. Um, uh, Tony Ferkins has asked how much CO2 reduction is expected in 2021 from the initiative you've mentioned this evening. Uh, so we've gone through a, a fair number of initiatives, obviously with, with, with uh, uh, my colleague Paul here talking a lot about the transport uh, measures. And we did see a very significant drop in the amount of carbon uh, emissions from transport um, at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. It has been a very diff uh, varied picture over the last uh, couple of months as uh, traffic has returned, particularly in outer London. So we're in a, we're in a real state of flux. I, I use that example for, for transport, but it applies to home working, it applies to office buildings, it applies to all manner of things. So I think it would be wrong to try and project into the future at this stage um, as to, as to what, where the situation will be in 2021. But clearly we are putting a significant amount of effort into here and, and also applying for a large amount of money from central government uh, to do uh, measures that will, will further uh, decrease carbon emissions over the coming uh, the coming decade in line in line with the plan. Um, uh, Tony's further asked what the progress is on zero carbon electricity. Um, so certainly the intent was to purchase all zero carbon electricity from October. I have to say I haven't actually uh, double checked that that has happened. I will do so. And Tony, um, I have your email address, so I will email you uh, and confirm that that has, uh, that has happened or, or provide an update uh, otherwise. Um, OK, so um, those are the questions on the first item of the agenda. Um, Councillor Dunn, I would ask if you had anything to add on those. Um, no, Mark, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, so there's a question here, um, uh, Paul, um, which is about um, consult how much consultation has happened with local communities uh, in respect to the um, street space programme. Can you just uh, say a few words about that? Yes, yeah, certainly. So we carried out an extensive consultation uh, at the very start of the programme in May and June. To, to assess the levels of support for these kind of measures a, a, across the borough. Um, that was the one where we got uh, over 4,000 uh, different bits of feedback for, um, which showed that around 60% of respondents there were supportive of, of, of a street space programme and, and the kind of measures that the council has since been implementing. In terms of the consultation in advance of these schemes, now these have been uh, put in using uh, experimental traffic orders. Now, these haven't just been brought into being for the for the street space programme. These these measures have been available to councils to use for uh, a, a considerable length of time and, and lots of councils use them. 
but it's very much for this kind of environment that we're in now where it's a changing environment um, and so rather than consulting on a permanent scheme and, and, and putting it in and risking it needing to change or amend or alter depending on, on, on a slightly changing environment, it gives you the opportunity to put in a trial scheme um, and then consult on it whilst it's in and whilst changes are ongoing and that is our proposal. So every one of these schemes is still open to consultation now and I'd urge everybody to feed into those but just also reinforcing the fact that the council is open and it's listening here to that feedback and there are you know the, there will be changes made at both the interim and the final review stages of that I'm sure based upon that community feedback and community engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, so uh, just another couple of questions which I'll, I'll, I'll take on street space uh, to give Paul a break. Um, so uh, somebody's asked a question about the cycle lanes on Twickenham Road that Paul had a picture of and just raising concerns there about the, whether they're blocking the ambulance service a passage. Uh, certainly this is something that we've kept into, into review. We actually changed the design in response to feedback from the emergency services uh, that's led to the uh, the ones that provide the segregation between the, the traffic lane and the cycle lane being, being a wider spacing which allows for the nose of vehicles to go into it if need be if there's a vehicle uh, on the road uh, under blue light running so it should allow uh, uh, ambulances to go past but clearly this is something that we're that we're monitoring and we're also engaging with the emergency services um, there's a question here about Ivy Bridge School and, and just saying thank you for the uh, the school street there, but just questioning uh, why it's taken quite so long. I mean, I think it's fair to say that school streets are a relatively new uh, idea. I think the only the first one was probably only implemented maybe two, two and a bit years ago in Hackney. Uh, we implemented our first school street uh, last year, I think, in um, as part of the Nishcam uh, development on Gower. Uh, and in this year alone, I think we're on track to implement 30 school streets. I think we've got the largest or certainly perhaps the second largest yeah. program across the whole of London. So um, I, I appreciate the concerns uh, that have been raised there and we've been aware of that concern on Hyperbread for a long time but to be fair it's only really now that the technology and the techniques have caught up uh, at, in able, to enable us to address those concerns. Um, there's a question here about whether um, the decisions, the final decisions on this scheme should be made at the area forum and certainly we've indicated on the cabinet report that there is a role for area forums to provide feedback on the schemes ahead of any final decision being made and we've also really um, uh, hardwired the role of ward councillors into the uh, the process so they'll get to see the interim and final reviews uh, for comment uh, before they are finalised and provided to the decision maker um, but it is a borough wide scheme so the purview for the programme as a whole sits um, with, uh, with cabinet in, in discussion with the relevant um, uh, lead member. Um, uh, OK, so we have uh, another couple of comments that have come back about consultation points. Um, I mean, there was a point here about whether the consultation pool was 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 representative of, of, of residents. And I know this is something that we've that we've discussed. And yeah. as part of that consultation, we, we did ask questions about people's um, opinion on whether we should be reallocating road space or not uh, for people who are walking and cycling and creating space for social distancing. And then there was a quite a significant amount number that were in support uh, of those measures. Um, uh, however, that also came up in a representative sample of, of, of Londoners that was polled for um, a, uh, an organisation called Centre for London. So it gave us gave us some 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 measure of um, uh, confidence that the, the the sample that entered into our consultation was was representative of Londoners. The fact that they felt broadly the same as that that representative sample. Yeah. Um, and I think that is largely the questions are from the, the public here. I see Tony's asked another specific one, Chair, uh, but I'll, I'll try and get back to him separately on that. OK, thank you very much for that, Mark. I'll now uh, begin the process of allowing members to ask questions. Richard. Right. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, and thank you, Paul, for that presentation. Um, and I think Mark has answered part of my question there by saying um, that ward councillors will be involved in the um, interim and final reviews. Um, but I uh, also want to um, make sure that we've um, uh, that we're still going to be involved 
um, in the design before these um, schemes in our wards go live. Um, I appreciate that the um, uh, these are experimental, um, yeah. but um, I'm also very conscious that from the pandemic and the lockdown, um, there is uh, that is uh, and the economic uncertainty and things around that. Many of our residents are ex under extreme uh, pressure. Um, there, that uh, in many cases, personal resilience is uh, significantly worn down. Um, so, um, a um, poorly thought out um, or uh, scheme that has an adverse impact on their day-to-day -day, uh, um, movements um, is uh, uh, is likely to disproportionately affect um, um, some residents. So we want to be very careful about that. Um, on a related thing uh, point, you said that the um, draft equality impact assessment is available. Um, can you tell me where that is available or send that to me, please? Because right. I um, uh, it was referenced in the cabinet report, but it, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it hasn't been published either to the public or made available to uh, to councillors. Um, and I think finally, I think detail is important with things like this. And I just want to pick up on Northumberland. In your presentation, you are referring to Northumberland Road. We do not have a Northumberland Road. It is Northumberland Avenue. Um, in um, Austerley and Spring Grove uh, Ward. And um, um, yeah, and that is one which uh, we have given very clear uh, feedback to um, Mark about um, what interventions would be um, reasonable to test there and uh, what um, would not be. Um, it, uh, um, there's there must not be great big planters uh, stuck in the middle of that um, uh, of that estate. Um, that that is a, a complete red line as far as um, um, the ward, uh, all three ward councillors there are concerned. So, um, and I think I believe that that's been taken. That um, advice must have been taken on board. So, um, I've enjoyed working um, with Mark over a number of years. Um, and Paul, I look forward to working with you over at least um, the next few months of, uh, or, or beyond. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul, Paul I'll, I'll kick off if you like, and then uh, you can add anything in further. So, I mean, for absolutely, Councillor Easton, as, uh, as you'd have noted, that we, we certainly have engaged with board councillors and certainly on this, this, this latter tranche of schemes where we've got a little bit more time to develop them. And, and we, I think we had a very constructive session um, last week, I think it was, uh, going through the detail of some of the, the proposals for, 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 for Isleworth Ward, and, uh, for Ostley and Spring Grove Ward. And it was it was great to see that you you supported um, some elements of those as well and, and wanted those brought forward, which is which is positive. So we certainly completely commit to in, uh, continuing to engage with board councillors on that. Um, in terms of the EQIA, the, the reason it hasn't been published is because it's not finalised. So it will be published as part of any final decisions on the scheme. Uh, but certainly we're happy to talk you through the, the sort of key, key findings from that. And it's very much in line with other EQIA we've done on, on similar projects and also uh, those that have been done by TfL on the general street space programme. They've taken into account some specific considerations for um, individual schemes, um, as noted. And uh, yeah, apologies, uh, detail is important. And uh, that's, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, Paul can be forgiven because he's only been with us for a few weeks, but uh, for me, that's unforgivable. So sorry for that. Uh, so I, I'll just echo what Mark said, really, you know, the, the, the member consultation and engagement is it clearly sits at the heart of, of, of what our process uh, is currently looking at. And I'm I'm really pleased to see how passionate that you, you are about these measures and wanting to feed in is great. Um, and, and I'll hold my hands up to the Northumberland Avenue Road. Um, so uh, apologies from me. Thank you very much, Paul and Mark. I've got Mel on the line with a, a yep. couple of questions for you next. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. My, my first one is one that you might expect me to ask. Um, can I ask um, who is going to be responsible for um, any enforcement where adults <coughs> uh, break the law by cycling on the pavements where, where uh, cycle lanes have been introduced? That's my first question. 
And the second one is where traffic is being displaced onto major roads. Um, how is the uh, how are you going to monitor air quality and pollution to ensure that by displacement we're not actually saddling ourselves by going backwards on air quality rather than the pro rather than damaging the progress we've already made. While I've got the f my phone, please, Chair, can I welcome Paul to the scene? Um, I look forward to working with him, particularly when lo lockdown is finished. And can I say a hearty big thank you to Mark Frost for all the work he's done with me on IBATH as chair and vice chair and as a member, and also with my work with the London Road Safety Council. It has been an absolute pleasure to have worked with you, Mark. Uh, chair, that's my two questions and my what, whatever you call it. Uh, thank you for those, Councillor, and, and likewise, I'm, re I'm really keen to, uh, to engage and start working with you. Uh, so uh, the first question was around enforcement here, around people cycling on, on pavements and um, etc. Now, as a council, we clearly don't have the powers there, but what we do have is a really good relationship and a, and a constructive working relationship with um, with the police services. So if those kind of measures were to be uh, were, were to arrive, we will clearly work through that through that partnership with the police to try and get us some enforcement there and, and address any concerns. Uh, in terms of displaced traffic on onto major roads, um, you know, we have quite a, a broad network of diffusion tubes a, a, around the borough and we will be continuing that that monitoring now moving forward looking at the potential impacts you, you're quite right you know if, uh, if if an area here was seeing additional traffic you know it would be incumbent upon us then to, to take measures to try and resolve some of the some of those issues so there will be active monitoring ongoing from from here on forward thank you thank you thank you thank you paul I'd, I'd like to jump in with a question i also see a couple more from members of the public so i'll hand back over to mark in a second but uh, I mean, so in, in the area where where I live, I'm finding quite a lot of goodwill towards these um, the, these measures. A lot of people seem to, uh, to to very much like them. One of the few criticisms that I do hear is over the aesthetics of the planters, particularly where we have concrete planters, which um, are not particularly favoured. I, I, I would say. Now, can, what reassurance can you give to residents that were ski, are ski, in the event schemes are approved, where they prove successful? What will the final aesthetic look like? What will the planters be replaced with? Um, so uh, I, d I don't have the final schemes in front of me in terms of what they'll look, but y you're quite right. You know, I've, I've looked at quite a number of the temporary measures that are currently in place. Um, I think we've done, from, from uh, trying to defend here, say, I think they've done as, as good a job as they could with with the limited tools that are available for things like temporary measure because it, it's a hard balance to uh, um, to strike that where you are we're wanting to demonstrate that these are trial measures that they're not permanent schemes so you know quite rightly so we don't want to spend a fortune at this moment in time saying we've already made our minds up this is you know this is a really expensive answer but you know in terms of the the schemes that would be developed if these were to be made permanently we would be revisiting a number of those schemes here and i think that that's something that i would look to do in discussion here uh, and i'll i'll certainly be picking it up with mark around what consultation we could do here uh, whether that's with the local ward members or anybody else to get feedback into what that final scheme will look like so the final choice of things like planters you know I, i'm not overly precious i don't have a set idea in my head about what they'll look like but I am really keen here to get community buy into whatever whatever the final measures are. Thanks very much, Paul. Mark, would you like to come in with the, uh, I think there's a few more resident questions. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, so just noting um, Barbara from Ogre correcting me that Nishcan was implemented in 2018, um, even longer ago than I, than, than I thought. Um, so thank you for that. Um, a uh, question here from someone called Maria, uh, who had actually emailed us prior to the event, uh, Chair, just raising some concerns about um, uh, enforcement of school streets and also the um, 
there was a particular incident where a large lorry that was working on behalf of Hauser Highways um, mounted a footway just outside Green Dragon School. Um, so just if I can pick up the enforcement one, and we did have a question that was sent in from a member of the public um, who lives on Teesdale Avenue um, uh, as well on this, and just asking about whether these these temporary measures are being enforced. Uh, I mean, I can, can confirm we, we can enforce them and, and we are enforcing them uh, most of the time via um, mobile uh, camera, mobile AMPR. Um, so clearly it's not there all the time, but it, it could be there. Um, however, what we want to do is move to a fixed camera enforcement arrangement and we're in the process of procuring them. But um, as, um, as Paul uh, noted at the beginning of the meeting, every single authority in the country is going through this process at the moment. Uh, and certainly all the ones in London are busy buying cameras left, right and centre. So there's been a sort of nationwide, nationwide shortage of those. Um, but certainly certainly the, the, the intent is to do a lot more enforcement. And certainly when this scheme is made permanent, there will be there will be an enforcement solution. Um, and in respect to that specific incident, um, Maria, I can confirm that that driver has been identified by Hounslow Highways. He has been red carded. So that's a, um, a final warning. So it's kind of like a yellow card, actually. Um, and uh, that is being uh, and it, uh, it, the supervisor has been spoken to. And they're also providing some further uh, what they call a toolbox talk. So it becomes an item in the agenda and every morning in the in the prior to construction commencing on any of the schemes. So that, that was picked up very quickly by House of Highways as a very serious matter and has been um, has been uh, sought to be addressed. Um, there is a question here from um, a, a, a resident. Um, there's, a, there's a vast difference between a disabled person or senior using their car to make essential journeys and someone using their SUV to do their shopping around the corner. How can you make the distinction in order to persuade lazy drivers to walk and cycle and take the bus and make it easier for those who have to use their cars? Um, and then just another question, are the SUV drivers loudest when it comes to complaining? Um, Paul, would you like to have a stab at that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to a, a lot of what I said earlier here. Um, you know, we we can we take it really seriously here, making sure that there are access here for those people who really need it. So those people who are registered blue badge holders, clearly we, we've made specific provisions for them. Uh, but it is quite difficult here to distinguish between a lot of the other users. Um, you know, we, we don't have various colour schemes for various different people, whether they live in the area, how close they live to the shops. Um, so, you know, we, we can't really address people who decided to take their, and, and certainly in terms of what car they drive, to take their SUV on a short journey to, to the shop. So, you know, our, our focus here is, is very much around, around need. And those people with an identified and, and, and genuine need, we have made provisions for. Thanks, Paul. Catherine, uh, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I mean, obviously, Paul's right. That this, because the schemes have to allow for, for, for some people to be able to, to have access, then it, it, it makes it difficult. But I would, what I wanted to add is that we are we are obviously carrying out other measures to um, discourage people from having highly polluting vehicles. Um, so, for example, through our parking charges in um, uh, residence parking CPZ schemes, um, there's currently a, a diesel surcharge and there's a reduction for um, low emissions vehicles. And we are looking at, at how we can change that further to have further um, gradation um, depending on, on how polluting um, someone's vehicle is. So obviously that that can encourage people to have less polluting vehicles um, and, and drive the, the more um, energy efficient ones. Um, there's obviously uh, you know other incentives um, for, for people to do that as well. Um, so not just um, on street parking, we've, been, you know, we've looked at off street parking as well and, and other things. Um, you know, ultimately, if someone wants to drive, they probably will drive. Um, but we we are looking to <laughs> firstly make it as easy as possible for people to choose other methods of transport um, and make it safe for people to for people to feel safe using other methods of transport. I mean, lots of people don't feel safe cycling around um, and, and, and we have to change that. Um, and and then yeah and then and then doing what we can to deter the the most polluting forms of transport as I've said. 
Thanks, Catherine. Guy. You're on mute, Guy. I'll say I was saying I wanted something to add to add something to that, and I was incapable because I was on mute. Um, I, I mean, one of the interesting things that that's come out of the the many letters that I've had uh, in terms of feedback um, on these schemes is that practically everybody uh, who's written with a negative view has said I never use the car um, unless I absolutely have to. Um, uh, uh, you know, practically everybody says that. And if that's the case, um, the people who are engaging in this are people who are taking a, a responsible attitude to, towards use of cars. I mean, some people say these are anti-car schemes. They're not anti-car schemes. They're anti. They're, they're, they're designed to discourage people from using cars when they don't need to, uh, and when other forms would be would, would be more appropriate. Um, I, I, I do think that one of the things that uh, that, that we'd like to see. Uh, and this is this is not just about these schemes. It's about um, uh, carbon reduction and a general change in our behaviour in this country. It is you know, people to start using active forms of travel um, uh, and, and, and confining mechanical transport to where they actually need it. Um, and if 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 we're seeing the beginning of that change of culture. Um, a bit like, you know, when I was allowed it, but mo many people drunk and drive. Uh, now, very few people do um, uh, uh, because the culture's changed. And I, I'm hoping that we're seeing a change of culture between I drive everywhere uh, to well, I drive when I have to uh, within, you know, urban areas. Thanks. Thanks, Guy. OK, Mark, I, are there any other questions from the public on this item? Uh, yeah, I've got a couple here, Chair. So I've got another one from Tony Ferkins asking for um, numerical evidence for increased cycling and walking per head uh, uh, for low traffic neighbourhoods. Uh, I know that TfL are doing a, a huge amount of work on this at the moment and doing um, quite a lot of monitoring. And obviously, we're, we're also looking at that through the monitoring and evaluation of our own schemes. Um, I mean, what, what I can tell you that um, during the course of the uh, of the lockdown, certainly in the early months, that cycling itself was up 150 percent. And widely that's credited for um, both the fact that people were out there doing their, their one day of exercise, but also because the traffic levels on the roads were very, were very low. So the fear and the concern that people have for going out on, on, on two wheels on the roads was, was simply not there because the traffic wasn't there to scare them. So there's definitely a link between those two. Um, can we prove it empirically at this current time? I think there's probably a little bit more to do, um, but certainly, um, certainly something to do on that. Um, and I think that's I think that's most of the rest of it. A lot of the uh, other questions that have just come back on the ones that I've given. So um, yeah, we'll move on. I think. Well, let's uh, let's move on to open forum. Thank you very much, Paul, for that. Let's move on to open Thank forum. You. And um, I know we've got a, a fair few questions in already. Obviously, if um, if any further questions want to come in through the Q and A, even if there if there if there are more questions on LTNs, we can take them. We've got. 21 minutes um, or for further Q&A in open forum on any topic. Mark. OK, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. So I've, um, I'm going to try and, and announce the questions that we've had in uh, to date. Uh, so the first question that I'm going to try and announce uh, are two questions that are on the uh, Tesco home base site. Um, and uh, these are questions from um, Ogre again, and also uh, a resident on behalf of uh, Mesra, the Marlborough Road, Epworth Road and Zion Loan uh, Residents Association. Uh, these are asking um, questions of ward councillors, asking uh, how you perceive the, the scheme uh, that is coming forward on the on the Tesco and home base site. Um, now, obviously, this is a live planning application. Uh, so I have a statement here from our uh, of our, our planners, uh, which is uh, just to you know, note the comments that have been received on, from on, from both these parties and of course many others that have been received on this um, uh, on this planning application um, or any comments that are, are attached to the case file fully accounted for during uh, the, for consideration during the uh, the process of the determination of the application um, unfortunately they, they do get to the planners do get a, a huge number of representations so they're not able to respond to individual comments um, but a comprehensive response to all concerns raised will be included in the officer's report for the application. Um, obviously, this is asking for ward members' uh, views on this, and, and I'm just here to remind you that um, under the town uh, planning code of good practice, uh, 
uh, contained within the constitution, you, you must be careful not to fetter your discretion concerning planning applications by expressing uh, 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 views on these uh, ahead of the determination. Um, but by all means, you can certainly listen to the concerns raised. Thanks, Mark. As a member of the planning committee myself, I, I, I certainly appreciate um, those, those comments. Richard. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think as the two resident associations that have asked the question probably already know, I have um, quite a lot of concerns about the scale of these proposed developments, um, particularly the height, which involves uh, tower blocks up to 17 storeys and the uh, mix of properties that are going into there where it is predominantly one and two bedroom uh, properties which does not line up with um, the um, um, uh, with the housing need in the borough which is uh, for a large proportion of um, uh, three bedroom and greater houses so um, I hope I'm not fettering uh, by suggesting that I would like to see that land used in a, uh, a slight uh, or consideration given to that land being used in a different way. Uh, but I and I've been doing the my utmost to ensure that residents concerns are heard and I will continue to um, um, help amplify um, uh, residents concerns. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Would anyone else like to comment or do we have further questions? OK, oh, Catherine. Um, I mean, just to say that, I, you know, I'd probably share um, some of those concerns. Um, obviously, you know, understanding that I haven't I haven't um, seen the, the full presentation from from both uh, on both sides of the argument here, but um, certainly those the concerns as raised by by residents and and councillors uh, do ring ring true to me. Um, as I was asked, <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, uh, Mark, do we have further questions in? No, Darnish. Darnish, you got your camera on. No, swiftly, swiftly runs away as well. Okay, Mark. OK, so we've had a number of questions in from from a resident on a, on a variety of topics. Um, this is the first one. So asking whether council tax is going to be increased to pay for the actions uh, in the climate emergency action plan. Um, Councillor Dunn, did you want to say a word on that? Yeah, I can say a word on that. Um, so, well, what can I say? Will council tax be raised? Uh, I mean, council to pay for the actions in the climate emergency action plan. Uh, this is the, you know, there's there's a strong possibility that that council tax may need to be raised anyway. <laughs> um, we're we're obviously in in a particular financial position at the moment. Um, we, to, I mean, our position on, on council tax is is the same as it's always been, which is that we um, we raise it when we have to, and we we don't raise it. We we keep it low when we can. Um, we uh, we understand that council tax is um, a regressive tax, um, which does hit the poorest people hardest, and that is something that we so we're keen to avoid hurting those people more um, if we can. Um, having said that, obviously um, we've suffered a huge amount of cuts um, from central government in terms of our funding um, at a time when we've had increasing costs to pay with, and that is before COVID came on the scene. Um, so all those things will have to be taken into account. Um, I hope that you saw from my presentation earlier that when it comes to the Climate Emergency Action Plan, um, as indeed for other things um, that, that, that the Council is doing, we are always looking to see where we can leverage um, external funding um, in order to pay for the things that we need to do. So that's probably not, <laughs> it's not a yes or no answer there. Um, so sorry about that. Thanks, Catherine. Mark. You're on mute, Mark. No, I knew it. I knew I'd do that. Um, so uh, if I have a question from the same resident uh, asking about um, how the COVID emergency funding received from the government under COVID emergency arrangements has uh, been employed and, and how this whether this spend has been 
subject to uh, to scrutiny. So um, I had a, a, a conversation with our, the, the borough's head of finance, um, and uh, he, he's confirmed that they, there was a mixture of grants available. Some of these were, were, were fully prescribed by central government. I, you know, we can only spend them on certain things. Others had a bit more opportunity for local discretion. Um, all, received, all funds received from government to support our COVID response are managed in accordance with the decisions uh, we have made. Uh, and these have been uh, we, these have been published on our website, and um, uh, they have been uh, any applications received under these uh, for these grants have been processed to, have generally been processed in a in a in a, in a strict first come and first served manner. Um, okay, I have another question here. So here the inquirer has raised concerns about whether waste from Hounslow is incinerated and uh, given the environmental impact of this. And I think Councillor Lambert, you were going to say a word on this one. Thanks, yes. Um, our residual waste, uh, together with all the residual waste in West London, first off, you know, understand none of it goes to, none of it bar a little bit of asbestos and things like that goes to landfill. It all goes via Transport Avenue in Brentford uh, onto trains to an incinerator down near Bristol which is run by the West London Waste Authority. So this is true of the six councils that are part of the West London Waste Authority. Um, I, I went on a visit to that site. I think it must have been, it was either last year, I think it was last year. Um, and saw it's a very impressive site, so sort of massive incinerator, uh, creates electricity for, at the time they said 35,000 houses. Um, and obviously we're very concerned about pollution because there's a lot of um, uh, toxic stuff going uh, going into household waste and being burnt. Uh, they've got a, an enormously complex filtration system there um, and which filters out nearly everything that's nasty. And the, the comment by the plant manager was that for these six London boroughs, uh, what comes out of the chimney in terms of pollutants is about the same as four Range Rovers. So, um, so, uh, so, 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 yes, there is a little bit of pollution, but because it's because um, it's a very big plant and it's got very sophisticated cleansing technologies, uh, the pollution is not very significant. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, same residents asked for further details of how the accessibility improvements at Zion Lane Station that have recently been implemented and uh, soon come alive. Uh, so this is additional staircases to relieve congestion, um, not huge amounts of congestion at the moment, given the amount of homeworking, but certainly uh, pre pre pandemic, there was significant congestion at that station uh, in the morning and evening peaks. Um, and just how that was how that was funded and confirm it was it was funded from a range of section 106 uh, pots, mainly from the sky development um, also some funding from from transport for London that they give to the borough for improvements um, and uh, a contribution from Southwestern Railway under their franchise agreement with the, the DFT. Uh, the inquirer also asked about whether we've ever gained uh, funding from the access for all pot. Um, and I confirm not for that station, but we have done for both Kewbridge and Isleworth, once again, working with the uh, the train operating company, Southwestern Railway. And the uh, final one that I have in here is um, from uh, Ogre, who asked for a range of updates um, on strategic transport schemes for the um, Great West Corridor, uh, including new rail um, bus services, workplace parking levy, enhancements to Gillette Corner, etc. Um, well, I've actually responded by email today in full to to to, um, to Ogre, and what we're going to do is append that to the uh, the meeting note as well, so that will be available for the for the public records. So those updates are uh, available to everybody, um, and that's it. I think from the questions that we've we've had from um, uh, in advance. That's right. Thanks, Mark. There looks like a few more have appeared in the live q and I think we've got about five more minutes there if you want to if you want to pick up on those. Um, I can do. Um, so um, there's a question here about whether we may give more attention to protecting historic buildings or, or buildings of cultural significance um, and just raising concerns about what the impact is on, on Brentford from from um, high rise buildings. Um, uh, certainly we, we can note that. I don't know whether any councillors want to make any comments about, about that. I don't know if um, if uh, Brentford Ward councillors want to say anything about uh, Boston Manor House. So we've got some good news on that today, didn't we? Oh, I haven't seen that. We, well, we got, a, we got a load of funding in, didn't we? 
I, I, I can say something um, if you like. Yeah, um, if you would. The, the three ward councillors had a meeting today. I, I went, uh, I don't know, ten days ago to have a to have a, uh, a a lengthy session with the friends um, and went around Boston Manor House. Uh, what well, the park really? The, the issue is with the park, not the house. Um, and we had a a long session today with with a number of senior officers, mainly from Hanzo Council, some from Green Space. Um, talking about how to address these concerns. I mean, I think fundamentally, um, the, the, the there are big changes to the um, parkland around Boston Manor House, which are uh, which were heavily consulted a couple of years ago and are designed to, in particular, to open up sight lines to the river um, and to deal with. A lot of dodgy trees that and, and dodgy undergrowth that have been there for for a long time. Um, so it, it, it's a major investment, and of course, when these changes are coming, it looks awful because uh, a lot of trees are knocked down, um, and it takes a while to to clear up. And of course, it's winter, so things aren't growing, um, and and what is what is grown doesn't have any leaves on it, etc. That there are some specific issues raised by the friends that um, that, that that we do need to address. Um, in particular, um, two of the trees that were planted um, to commemorate the murder of Alice Gross. There were 14 trees, and two of them have died. Um, they've been replaced by saplings, and people aren't happy about that. And I think we all understand that. Um, there, there are also some some concerns about hedges and, and, and various other things. Um, we, we, the officers will be addressing that. Uh, we are planning to have um, a meeting on site as soon as the um, the um, the lockdown is over, and that we'll be inviting friends to come along to that and to uh, address these things further. Um, but uh, you know, in the end. Boston Manor Park has been not particularly well maintained by a succession of different um, contractors for for many years. It needs major investment. It is getting major investment. We went to the lottery Heritage Lottery Fund, got a lot of money to do that. That's what we're doing. In the short term, it's going to look a bit um, untidy um, until such time as it's um, as it's restored. And of course, there will be differences of opinion about. Um, you know, some, some, some of the undergrowth that's being taken out did support wildlife, but the feeling is that uh, a better quality under, undergrowth, which will grow back, will support wildlife in a better manner. I, I'm not a, I'm not a horticultural or wildlife expert, but that's what the experts say. Thanks. Thanks. Mark, anything else? Um, OK, there's a question here about whether there's a plan for to, for us to provide permanent housing for rough sleepers in the area. Um, Councillor Dunn, did you want to say something on that? Yeah, I can say something on that. Um, so, yeah, and, and I noticed it, it also mentioned begging in a particular area. Um, I mean, well, the, the first thing to say is that that not everyone who is begging is a rough sleeper. Um, and it, it is obviously important for us to distinguish um, those who are rough sleeping and, and those who are who, who are not, uh, which is not to say that, that, that they don't also have, have complex needs. Um, so, I mean, certainly uh, we work, you know, we, we have a rough sleeping outreach team um, and and they work with with rough sleepers who are identified in the borough to to um, try and get them housed, um, possibly in, in temporary accommodation first, um, um, but also working with them with, with whatever needs they may have, referring them on to to specific services um, to to help get them in into a position where they can be permanently housed. Uh, there are obviously that the, there are people who choose not to engage um, with 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 those council officers or with or with the the charity um, officers um, that that um, that go out to try and work with them. 
um, and sometimes it's very hard, especially when you've got people who, who are quite entrenched um, in a particular um, way of living uh, because of, uh, of, of particular problems and, and, and issues that they may have. Um, what I will say is that we don't give up easily. Um, we, you know, sometimes it, it can take many weeks or even months of, of engagement with, with someone who has highly complex needs to, to gain their trust before that they will agree to, um, you know, to, to, to work with, with officers and, and, and be housed somewhere. Um, and, and obviously some of, the, some of the, the needs that people have mean that their behaviour towards other people is challenging as well. So it's, it's not an easy um, situation, but certainly our policy is not just to leave people and, and ignore them if, if they're sleeping rough, and it's not to um, try and punish them for that in any way either. Thank you very much, Catherine. I think that's probably all we have time for isn't it, Mark? I can't see that we have time to answer further questions. Uh, the only one, Chair, is I've just noted a, a comment here from um, Barbara uh, raising some concerns about the fact that the a question that they raised on the planning application hadn't been answered. Uh, I mean, it certainly has been noted, uh, Barbara, it has gone to the uh, uh, the planning uh, team and that, that concern will be addressed as part of their, any consideration of the planning application. And obviously, because it's a live planning application, we're, we're unable to talk about it in, in detail in this sort of forum. But um, you, you sort of suggested that that means that this whole process doesn't work. I actually think that um, overall it's, it has worked quite well to Tonight, but that's my view. Thank you. I, I certainly share your view, Mark. Of course, it uh, you know it's it's always a struggle adapting uh, a, a live meeting to online, especially one with so many questions. But we got through a lot of questions, and I'm very grateful to to you, Mark, to officers, to councillors, and to members of the public for all the work that's gone into putting this area forum together, and um, and and to, uh, to 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 answering residents. Very, very good question. So it, it just leaves me to say that the next uh, next meeting of the Isleworth and Brentford Area Forum is provisionally scheduled for the 4th of February, but it hasn't been confirmed. So please check the council website for details. I imagine it's probably going to be a virtual meeting again, but then we do hear that a, a vaccine could be, uh, could be rolled out in the coming weeks. So you never know. Uh, maybe the next time we all see each other, we'll be face to face. And if not, let us hope the time after that. In, in the meantime, thank you very much everyone for coming and I wish you a good night. Thank you, Chair.